All right, so I am here with Kevin Simbita. Uh, real quick, station identification. Welcome to the Robertson Rebellion. This is a rebel's guide to sci-fi, pop culture, and gaming. I'm your host, Sean Owen Robertson, a.k.a. Rebel One. Uh, proud author, game designer, and sci-fi enthusiast. Uh, enlist in the cause, subscribe to the channel, and activate updates to join me for live interactive episodes. That said, today is a little uh, something different. We're not doing a live interactive episode. Instead, we're doing a live stream, and I've already polled the fan community for a lot of questions that they are just dying to have me ask Kevin. <laughs> um, but this is all in honor of Gen Con Online, and, uh, and, and then we'll be uploading this to my YouTube channel. Um, it's a little bit long form and free form. Kevin and I can chat when we get going. So uh, it doesn't fit within their time constraints. But we're also going to um, be doing this on, I think clips of this are going to be appearing on Palladium TV as well. So uh, look for some of those clips in the near future and go, go subscribe to Palladium TV if you haven't yet. Um, all right, so this is a cooperative interview between Kevin and I. So uh, he, I'm going to ask him some questions. He's asked me some of the same questions or similar questions. Um, Kevin is the founder and mastermind behind Palladium Books, Inc., and creator of the post-apocalyptic world of Rifts, uh, which, as any viewer knows, I'm a big fan. Um, it's a world with three decades of history and over 60 published supplements, big books, awesome art, great stuff. Um, Kevin has done a lot of other great stuff, but this discussion will focus on the traditional Rifts line of problem of products published by Palladium Books. We'll also be talking about my much shorter career and Savage Rifts, which is a licensed version of Rifts for use with the Savage Worlds RPG system by Pinnacle Entertainment, which I manage that product line. So just a little bit of info and background for anybody who's coming to this and doesn't know who one or both of us are. <laughs> um, I know it's, it's funny because we'll talk about this later, but it's really been really interesting to have Savage Rifts, there's a lot of fans of Savage Worlds, a lot of fans of Palladium books and Rifts, but Savage Rifts has gotten fans that knew neither before, and that's been really interesting too. So I'm going to try and make sure I provide a little bit of background for everybody watching this interview. Um, so first, let's go over some personal basics. Um, first off, Kevin, you and I have been communi communicating for a few years and finally met at uh, Gen Con last year, right? Yep. It's been kind of crazy because we, I mean, it's been a, it's been a few years. We've been like emailing and then I was calling and then, oh yeah, you, you know, you, <laughs> you had to, you couldn't get away from me. And we were talking about art <laughs> approvals and back and forth, but we finally got to meet at Gen Con last year. So, uh, it doesn't feel like it's been a whole year. No, it doesn't. But, uh, and this year's a little different with everything going on with the pandemic, but yeah, this is going to be really cool. Um, so, Kevin, first off, where are you from? Where'd you Where'd you go to school? I uh, I was born and grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, I went to school uh, at uh, at St. Andrews. It's a Catholic school, and then uh, I went to the Center for Creative Studies, which was uh, an art school because my original goal and dream was to be a comic book writer and artist. Right. And uh, I figured some formal education would be good, and uh, they were foolish to let me in uh, on a partial scholarship, so uh, that worked for me. And, uh, you know, I, I learned how to paint and do some different things, and it was, it was good. Awesome, awesome. Um, so, yeah, I, my personal background, I'm from Houston, Texas, a proud Texan here. Um, I went to school in the area. Um, I joined the military, and um, my first degree that I got was from the Defense Language Institute in Mandarin, or well, Chinese studies, I should say, and Mandarin Chinese. Um, and then I got an associate's degree in visual communications and graphic design. Like you, I, I, when I was younger, I was really into artists. I went to, like, there's a school in Houston called the Glassell School of Art and took a whole bunch of art classes. And I just say that I'm not in the top 10%. Of artists, and I think if you really want to survive, if you want to thrive, you need to be in the top five percent and be dedicated of ta pure raw talent and be dedicated to it. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting when I was uh, when I went back to school using the GI Bill, I found that I was talented in that sphere, but I'm I feel like I have more talent in the in like the layout and design and presentation stuff, um, which meshed more with my writing ability. So that's been interesting. And from there, I moved on to the University of Texas in Dallas, where I 
studied game design and production in a program that was designed for video games and or animated movies. But I, I, I took a lot of game design and writing classes and stuff like that. So, um, well, cool. It seems like we both kind of came around to role-playing games a little roundabout. Um, yes. How did you get started in the industry? I know some of the, or industry, you know, uh, I know that I know some of the story, but, but what, what can you share with fans? Yeah. So, so part of my informal education was, uh, at least in gaming was becoming part of the Detroit gaming center. Um, I, uh, was working at an art supply store and my, uh, coworker and friend at Julius Rosenstein introduced me to a number of other people who were running games off of Wayne State University's campus. And that's where I met Eric Woodjick and, and uh, Matt Ballant and a lot of other people. And uh, we, uh, Eric had this great idea of starting a, a gaming center. And of course, I, I was all for it. And I don't know, about eight or nine of us got together and pooled our resources and we rented this cool place downtown Detroit and uh well it was cool for us who were all like you know in our 20s it was actually a really bad area where you had hookers and, <laughs> you know all kinds of <laughs> you know it was not a great neighborhood sure. and uh but, uh, you know, in fact, our, our, our facility used to be a methadone clinic. Wow. Yeah. So the cool thing about that was everyone who was, all of us were really into gaming. Yeah. And so when a new product came out, somebody bought it. And so we would see it at the gaming center and be able to play it or, or study it. Uh, and the other great thing about the gaming center was because there were all these game masters. It was, it, you know, being on a college campus, you know, we would have 100 to 200 people show up at the gaming center every weekend. Oh, so it was like, awesome. yeah, it was amazing. And so it was like this mini con every weekend. Um, and so what really worked for me is I got to see all these different uh, styles of, of gaming and approaches to role playing. Um, which, you know, I would then take the stuff that I really liked and, uh, you know, incorporate it into my own game and, you know, be learning all these different approaches. So that was, that, that was pretty amazing. And, and for me, it started out like for, I think a lot of people, it was just a hobby and, and I got really into it and, uh, I started playing D and D the original little booklet version of D and D and, um, we, uh, I, I just had a great time um, with it. Uh, although my initial introduction to D&D was role-playing blows. Um, Julius had introduced me to his game master, who it became very clear to me that he didn't want to have four new players added to his game. And in <laughs> fairness to him, he already had like six people. Oh, yeah, that's a lot for me. It's a lot, about, yeah. right. So... My, my first two gaming experiences were, were not fun at all. I, I didn't care for it at all. And I'm like, yeah, just what I thought. Role-playing stinks. And uh, so Julia said, well, look, you know, it isn't. It's really cool. Why don't you let me run you guys? Uh, it'll just be a small four-person game. And I'm like, I, I guess. And then I decided I didn't want to play. And the other three people, it was like, you know, grade school all of a sudden, oh, if Kevin, if you don't play, we're not going to play. <laughs> I'm like, what? Uh, I said, I don't want to. You guys want to. And they're like, no, but but if you're not going to play, we're not going to play. And I'm like, fine, I'm playing my one last time. Julius is an amazing game master. Uh, I had the time of my life. My character even died uh, at the end of the game. And, I, and it didn't matter. Because I, I died Sometimes being stupid. Me. The character was, was, we had gone through all this cool stuff. Yeah. We're running our lives against Knowles. And uh, we had gotten out. We got out of the dungeon. We're free and clear. And I, my character opens up the dungeon doors to flip off our pursuers. Shoop! <laughs> With a giant sized arrow. I was already down hit points. I think I only had 11 to begin with. Right. Because uh, I was like a wizard thief or something, and 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 it was like, 
and poor Julius, he was he was just like, oh, I'm sorry, your your character died, um, and I'm like, what? <laughs> and he's like, well, but you know, they were after you, and you got away, and and why did you turn back and 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 flip them the bird? And I'm like, oh yeah, good point. This is great. <laughs> your actions have consequences, right? Right. So. And so. I was hooked after that. And even then, for me, it was supposed to be temporary until I broke into comic books. And I was doing freelance art uh, in a lot of different um, areas and had self-published a comic book and had, was working on uh, a comic book series through uh, Noble Comics, which did, um, what is it, Justice Machine and uh, Cobalt Blue and a few other things. Uh, you know, I was working with some comic book guys who would go on to become you know, important people like Bill Willingham and Mike Gustavich and, uh, um, it really great. Guys. D. Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I just thought those are, those are all, I mean, these names are, if, if anyone's familiar with that time period and, and with the stuff that they went on to do, it's, I mean, really great people. And it's funny because the, nowadays, I don't know if people would really understand the importance of a gaming center or something like that, because there was no internet. Right there is there was no YouTube. Right. You couldn't just go online and find a review of a role playing game. Um, you couldn't you couldn't just uh, hang out with your buddies online and, and play through a virtual tabletop. Right. So if you wanted to experience all these different types of gaming, if you wanted to experience all these different types of rules and really pour through them and, and experience them, you had to do it in person. I, I, it, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because that, that's so true. Uh, and, and, you know, we're so used to the internet these days and, uh, phones and, you know, smartphones and everything that, you know, even us who've lived through it, forget how, how isolating it really was. I mean, I think we had two hobby shops that sold role-playing games in the area, uh, when we first started. I mean, that would expand of course over the years, but, you know, in 1978, 79, there were two stores. Role playing was was brand spanking new, and and most people looked at you strangely when you said, I, I, "I'm into role playing games," and they're like, "Hmm." Well, to date you and myself, I was born in 1978, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid I'm an old guy. So well, you know, but the cool the cool thing is, right? I mean, you got involved in the industry. You started self publishing, and it, it. Correct me if I'm wrong. I think your first thing was the Mechanoids. Correct? Was that yes. That, that, that is correct. So, so what happened is I, I had actually d developed my Palladium Fantasy game. Uh, my, my game at the gaming center was was uh, so popular that I ran 26 guys on a regular basis every Saturday night. Wow. Uh, yeah, we only missed, I think, in three and a half years of, of playing with that group. Uh, I think we only missed like three, three days, three wow. Saturdays. That's and that's great. because it was like either... Uh, Christmas or New Year. <laughs> so it, my, my game got really popular and my guys pointed out to me that I had taken um, and, and built uh, on top of D&D &D so many house rules uh, and created all kinds of new characters and monsters and, and character classes that we really weren't playing D&D &D anymore. Right. And, and they suggested that I, I start, um, you know, that, that I, I get it published. So I shopped it around to everyone who was, who was you know, there in the day. Um, and I got no takers uh, except for a company called Judges Guild, hmm. which was doing all kinds of uh, source books for, for D&D. Because when D&D originally came out, TSR decided they're only going to focus on main books. Okay. And, and, and so Judges Guild, Bob Bledsaw was smart enough to see there was a huge market there. So Bob got the license to do source books for D&D uh, &D and Traveler and, and I think a couple other things. And uh, so uh, I, I, I pitched them and they said, tell you what, we'll give you a $500 upfront for, for your game, your game system. And uh, we'll give you a 2% royalty that slides down to a 1% royalty after we sell 10,000 copies. Well, I mean, I sat back and said, eh, you know, I'm not going to sell my game for, for peanuts. I'd yeah. rather sit on it and keep it. Yeah, you, that's, that's you know. a very low return, right? That's a crazy low return. It, yeah. So so then my guys were like, Kev, you have publishing experience. I mean, you know comic books and stuff. 
why don't you publish it yourself? And I was like, no. Because I couldn't... <laughs> You know, once I ate those those bastards and planted the idea, I couldn't get it out of my head. So I wanted to publish Palladium Fantasy, but I couldn't do it in the big soft cover book form that I wanted to do because that was going to cost me ten grand. Right. And I didn't have that kind of money. I grew up poor in in Detroit, and uh, there was no way I could afford to do that. But I, I did save up fifteen hundred dollars, and I borrowed another fifteen hundred dollars from a friend's mom. Uh, in fact, William Messner Loeb, another guy who would go on to do some amazing comic book stuff with The Flash and, and Wonder Woman. And uh, his mom was a sweetheart, and she lent me the other half to do the mechanoids. And, and in my mind, with the mechanoids was just sort of a, let's test the market, let's see if we can build. And so it was done in a comic book format, um, comic book size, because... Um, you know, that, that's what I really knew, and I knew it was, was cheap. I mean, I think we printed 5,000 copies of the basic, the first basic book for like 32 cents each. Okay. You know, I had an original cover price of like three ninety three ninety five on it, um, which I learned was, was too low. There's a price point where people, you know, it's, it's amazing the things you learn over the years. They think that it devalues the, the product, right? So, so, so my, right. So my very first Gen Con you know, we're, we're hawking mechanoids and people are interested, but they look at it and they, they ask, um, well, why is it so cheap? What's wrong with it? And I'm like, okay, lesson learned. Yeah. <laughs> you, you go with the market. Anyways, the mechanoids came out and then we did the weapon series and a few other things. And I just kept putting money back into the company. And, uh, Eventually, uh, I was able to produce the kind of books I wanted to do, the first of which was Palladium Fantasy. Gotcha. And, and at the time, nobody was doing uh, uh, soft cover books, uh, you know, perfect bound soft cover books. It was, strangely enough, it was a, it was a new technology hmm. at the time. And uh, so, uh, but yeah, Palladium Fantasy did well. And then a few years later, we do Ninja Turtles and everything took off and, you know, it was good. How about you? What? How did you get into, oh. well, especially as a writer and game designer? You know, it's kind of crazy because I, um, well, I was one of those people where I always, I mean, it's nothing like quite exactly what you had going on. I mean, that's a pretty cool story. <laughs> um, I, I actually personally, I, I was all, I was one of those kids that I was always writing something. I always did well whenever there was a written test or a portion of or uh, an essay. Um, and I like to write, and I would find myself, especially in my 20s, um, and a lot of people know this, I was a, a missionary for a couple of years right after high school. And yeah, I, that's very cool. It was, it was, it was a good experience, and I, I, I journaled every day. And I don't know if that kind of sparked something, because it was the first time I was writing every day. Um, and then after that, I just felt like throughout my twenties and stuff, I was, um, when I was working all these different crazy jobs, I've done a bunch of different crazy stuff. I've managed the games workshop store. Um, I, I actually talked to some guys back then about getting into the, um, at the time it was the American, uh, design studio. They had just opened a design studio in America for games workshop. And I, I never did it cause I didn't want to move to Baltimore, Maryland, which is funny mm. because later on I was stationed in Maryland when I, after I joined the air force, <laughs> oh, <laughs> like down the road from their old headquarters. <laughs> yeah. That, that's um, hilarious. Yeah. And then, uh, but I would always just write ideas for novels or ideas for games or board games and even write up rules and test them out on my friends and just always had this love of gaming. When I joined the air force, I would do a, a game night every week. And again, bother all my friends with game design and, and I knew it was a passion of mine after I got out of the Air Force. Um, I was working different mid-level management type jobs. And my best friend was like, dude, you're better than this. You're, you're not pursuing your own dream. You're working for other people. And he got me to go back to school. And so kind of when I went back to school, finding out that, hey, there is this niche of, of layout and, and, and graphic design and visual communications that I think that's actually something that I'm, I'm kind of talented at. And I really enjoy it. And a professor said, no, you're really talented. You need to be part of this internship program. You need to put your stuff into competitions. 
um, in the area, and I did, and, and it and it went well. And so I was like, he's ah, dang it, he's right, because <laughs> uh, I was thinking about going engineering when I went back to school, That's... and uh, and then he, which would have been a completely different life, right? And then um, from there, I I moved on to uh, University of Texas at Dallas, and while I was there studying, writing writing board games for classes, and it it would it would you know the class would end, and we'd keep working on the board game, and you know. Uh, uh, trying to do the different things with with a lot of friends, and I started going to some conventions. And this was uh, I did you know I was so busy with school. There was times where I was working part time, uh, going to school full time. You know, uh, eighteen credit hours, and it was just kind of nuts. Um, and finally, I I took a break and I uh, went to a convention and met uh, Shane Hensley and a bunch of the other guys that that do Savage Worlds. And we, we had a lot of fun, and, and uh, one of my buddies, uh, uh, Brandon, is, his dad worked on, uh, on um, uh, East Texas University, which is a very popular Savage World setting. It's kind of like Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but at college. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, and then it's really cool. And then uh, Shane and those guys were like, hey, come hang out with us and chat with us, and you need to come to this other convention. So I went to this other convention in Austin, ChupacabraCon has a crazy name but it's a lot of fun and I uh, love the the people there and and then I met uh, you know Sean Patrick Fannin and he was he had done riffs for Savage Worlds and I had just recently discovered it and we started chatting and he was like hey well why don't you why don't we talk more in the convention I ran into him at the front desk as he was checking in and um, just heard his name I and I recognized his name from the book and said, hey, yeah, you did Rifts for Savage Worlds. It's a really great job. It's a lot of work to try and do that. And uh, yeah, went to some different seminars and stuff. And he said, well, you know, long story short, he said, we chatted a lot that weekend. And he said, well, you know, we have a hard time finding people that are really hardcore Rifts fans that also know Savage Worlds. And I had recently, you know, in the, the during right before my, uh, well, actually, while I was going back to school, had found Savage Worlds. Um, I was looking for something quick to play with my friends. I didn't have the time, you know, to like I used to when I was a kid to go all weekend. I don't know what it is. Something about the internet seems to make our lives shorter, um, or our time with friends shorter. I don't know what that exactly how that works, but because uh, I used to play like you all weekend long, I would play riffs with my friends when I was a kid, right? So yeah. Long story short, they said, "Well, you send us an adventure." They they paid me for the adventure. I never saw it get published. And then one day Shane sent me a an offer to do a book. And I was kind of floored. I was still in college studying game design. And I'm like, but one of my professors, um, I don't know if you've heard of, um, let's see, it's uh, Michael Bro. Um, it's, he's also French descent, kind of like Wayne Bro, but they spell it differently. Um, but he worked on advanced Dungeons and Dragons and for instance, like, uh, uh, Oriental adventures and, and a whole bunch of products. Right. And then got into the video game industry when they started doing Dungeons and Dragons video games, like uh, pool of radiance. And he's done a bunch of crazy stuff, but he was one of my professors and he said, no, this looks like a good opportunity. He kind of gave me a pep talk and taught me through some basic strategies. And I accepted the book offer and, uh, it just kind of snowballed from there when that was done. Um, that well, it, we expanded it as it kept it kept growing as we moved forward from forty five thousand words to seventy five thousand, and I got to get in contact with you, and because I was trying to make sure that all the riffs lore stayed consistent, that the art was prepped for you so that we would have the highest chance of uh, getting it accepted, and uh, you know just trying to make sure everything really fit your vision for the world, and yeah, that's kind of how I got into this. Um, and so it's been a, it's been a, a wild ride, and it, and and it's been a lot of fun. That that is a wild ride. I, I did not realize that you were such a newbie when I, I first you know met you on the phone and we talked. And um, so I, I'm more impressed now than than even before because <laughs> uh, you know your work on on on, on Rifts or Savage World has been nothing short of outstanding. Thank, thanks, Kevin. That means a lot to me. It means a lot. Yeah, it, it's one of those things. I'm I'm surprised people like what I write. I I never really, you know what I mean. I don't know if you know what I mean, but uh, that's that's how I, I I still feel that way. Uh, because I I'm just like, oh well, they 
I'm glad they like the adventure material that I wrote, or I'm glad they write this or that. So, um, like I, I don't know if maybe I have a lot of confidence from my time in the military, you know, um, and I cut my teeth with a lot of great people at the University of Texas in Dallas. Um, and for instance, working with, um, with my professor bro, uh, he, he, he was a really great writing instructor. And so I knew if he liked my writing, if he approved of what I was working on, I even did a semester long project where I designed my own role playing game and we play tested it with the other students. Um, and I knew if he thought it was good, that it was probably decent because he's published a lot of stuff. Right. Um, <laughs> so I have to, I really have to thank, uh, you know, the, those people that really helped me refine my craft before I became, before I, so that I was ready to seize that chance, that opportunity. Um, but, uh, at the same time, you know, uh, it's been, it's been a lot of fun and, uh, I'm I'm really happy and really proud of, of of everything that we've worked on. I was really delighted when the Savage Worlds Adventure Edition, when all that happened, uh, to be a big part of, of updating everything for Rifts, and uh, yeah, it's been really awesome. I'm still get the biggest kick out of seeing the art, seeing everything in print. I don't know. There's something about seeing it come to life that's that's been really satisfying. What about you? What's what are you what what do you what gives you the biggest kick? What are, what work are you the proudest of? Uh, well, yeah, I, I have to, uh, I have to agree. It really helps having uh, some some really good people around you to to, to help nurture. Right, like you, I, I think I, I was a pretty bold uh, creator myself. I was pretty confident, but it really helped to have guys like Eric Wojcik and my, my whole crew and a bunch of other folks around me to offer input and. Y y you know, feedback of all kinds. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know what it is either. I, I always, I always said it was kind of like, uh, giving birth to a child uh, when a new book comes out. I mean, I've been doing this, it'll be 40 years next year. A and I still get excited when that new book comes out. And, and I mean, I wrote the damn thing, so I know what's in it. <laughs> I've seen all the art. I hope it will lay out. But holding that, but and that's where it's like like having a child. You know, you know what's in there. <laughs> you know it's coming, but to hold it in your hands, there's still that that thrill. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and, and and there is really nothing like it. Uh, the other thing I that that I love is when people, you know, come up to me and tell me how much they've enjoyed their books or or how much. Uh, my books have helped them get through hard times that that's especially uh heartwarming um because i, I never really thought about that aspect of my, my my products i mean I, i'm writing stuff to be fun and entertaining i don't think about how it might help someone get through depression or alcoholic parents or you know gang violence in inner city or or in the military we we would have lots and lots of people in the military order our books and especially when they order our christmas grab bags which are basically a half off kind of sale um and they tell me what books they want i would i would load them up because i know <laughs> they're going through rough times and I, I i know from experience having talked to these folks that you know the hardest part is the in-between time the waiting for action and if you have role-playing games going on you get lost in those worlds that's the beauty of role-playing so you know, that's that, that was one of the amazing things that I did not expect and anticipate when I started this career. And uh, I, I, it, it's wonderful. So, you know, it's yeah, it's it's it, interesting because it, it, it's art, but it's also this product that can that can help people deal with ideas, learn and grow as a person. There's yeah. a lot of research that's gone into that right now. And I saw a lot of that when I went back to school. Um, there's a lot of modern research. So if people don't know, the University of Texas at Dallas does a lot of um, cutting edge research into cognitive science and um, psychology and things like that, as well as their arts and technology program, which I was a part of. And so to see how it can actually literally change people's lives, literally give them skill sets to deal with things that they may not have had before or allow them to 
you know, separate themselves from an issue and then maybe in, in some way subconsciously attack it from a different direction. I think that can happen with, with veterans a lot too, uh, that can help them kind of, uh, you know, get to get 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 to another world, another place that completely lets them relax and and be get away from any any sort of trauma or or anxiety they might have about something. Um, that's really great too. Um, so sure. yeah, it's, it's really cool stuff. Well, let's. I want to dig into some 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 of the deeper stuff here real quick, if you don't mind. Well, Sean, you you mentioned that. Uh, you know, in our conversation already, you've, you've mentioned that you are familiar with, with the riffs as well as Savage Worlds. I mean, had yeah. you played riffs for a long time or were you kind of new to that too? Or? <laughs> yeah. So for me, um, I, so I started with right behind your head, you've got uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and other strangeness. Oh. And that was my yeah. gateway drug. <laughs> <laughs> A lot was, of people. I was a massive, massive Ninja Turtles fan, and I, I told you how I loved art. I was drawing them all the time, and uh, I I was reading the graphic novels, um, and so when when that when I saw that, and it was the same kind of art from the graphic novels. It's not this Saturday morning cartoon. It's it's something a lot grittier, and 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 there's more adult and interesting themes. Right? I've always been interested in in those more. Uh, gritty themes i guess i don't know what else to call them but uh i got in with that and then of course that expanded to uh heroes unlimited and ninjas and super spies and then um i i i was a big robotech fan and found robotech and so then i got into all i mean i've got all but i think all the robotech stuff um and a bunch of the ninja turtles stuff i mean it, back then it wasn't easy to get everything it, it, sometimes it was like can you find it <laughs> <laughs> do you even know that this thing got printed? So that was always an interesting experience back then. It wasn't as easy as firing up Amazon um, or drive through RPG or something. But uh, that's that's and that's how I got when I saw the you had little little blurbs about riffs in some of the books. At the end of your books, you'd have like a a marketing page or two, and I saw stuff and I was like, what is that? You know, the I think the first thing I ever saw was that illustration of a Triax Dinobot smashing the yeah. robotic brains out of another robot. And um, and then I saw the illustration with the the um, the Mark the Coalition Mark V APC and the and the CS Grunt, the dead boy standing out front. And I was like, I don't know what's going on. I gotta have this. And so it was actually kinda hard to get it right after it came out because it was so popular. Um, and I got it as soon as I could and uh, I was, you know, just a teenager. I was, I think, still in middle school, and I picked up. I found what I, I realized my copy was a third printing, <laughs> but that was as quick as I could get my hands on it and get the the funds together. But uh, yeah, I don't know if there was a delay there or or if I just didn't know exactly when it released and finally found out a few months later. I didn't go on comic book store trips all every week, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, and I, I played it. That was after that, that was my game. That was my jam. My buddies and I, a lot of them had never role played before. I said, well, you can role play as a dragon. And one guy was just, he was like, okay, I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> and other guys, I said, well, you can do whatever you want. And they did. Uh, and then I had a buddy, uh, who would, he would play just, he played a lot of the underpowered characters, right. And played the real thinking man's game and, and a lot of that all influenced my uh, my experience with riffs, but yeah, I've been playing. Um, and I and whenever a new book came out, I was waiting, and I would get it. And I my I remember my stepmom um, would just say, "Well, I'm glad you're reading. I don't know, understand what you're reading, <laughs> but you read. He's you spent all weekend reading. That can't they, they, that can't be bad, you know." <laughs> Um, but yeah, I just, I would just dive into those books and read them cover to cover over and over and over again. So, uh, yeah, that's that. I was definitely a big fan of Palladium, um, before I, uh, I mean, just that was very formative for me. I, I've got more Palladium products than I think any other game system, um, including all the D and D stuff I've ever bought combined. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, you probably got that book pretty quick because um, Riffs was a phenomenon. Um, yeah. It, you know, it was such 
I had spent three and a half years working on it, and there was just so much to it. I, I one of the things I love about role playing is that you, sh in, in my mind, anyways, you should be able as a player to do anything within reason within that setting. Right. And, and it always bugged me when people would come up with, well, you can't combine fantasy and science fiction, or you couldn't have, you know, super, excuse me, supernatural creatures with you know, fill in the blank. And I'm like, no, that's crazy. You should be able to do all this. So, so when I came up with riffs, it was this idea of creating this vast world, yet, yet a world that's familiar to us because it takes place on earth. And it just, I, I thought it was going to be good. I thought it was going to be big. I was super proud of it. I was super excited about it. Kevin Long, one of the main artists yeah. uh, and, and a dear friend, he, uh, he was sure it was going to be huge. And for me, you know, I put so much into it and it cost a lot of money. It was our first book with color art in it, along with black and white art. And I didn't know how it would sell. We, 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 we uh, printed 10,000 copies. We thought that was a safe run. And back in the day, I mean, 10,000 copies, you know, that, that would be huge for the sales of a, of a lifetime for, for a lot of product. And so we, we came out with ten, the first printing. We sold out those 10,000 copies in three weeks. And then we did a second run of another. Actually, I think we printed 20,000. And that sold out in three months. And then we did the third printing and on and on and on. And it was just. Okay, that like makes said, sense because I remember having a hard time trying to find it, you know. Um, yeah. And I didn't know if it was, I just had, you know, just weird timing because uh, back then it was hard to know. This is the day that this game you're waiting for is going to arrive. <laughs> no one's texting you or emailing you, right? I mean, this didn't happen. So you, it's hard to right. know when something was going to happen. Um, that is really cool. So my, my edition is actually not uh, not surprising. It's actually pretty. pretty no, it early. came out in the first six months. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, <laughs> that is awesome. Well, you know, and that's, you know, you talk about how you couldn't do all these different things. And that's one of the things that when I played Palladium games, that's what I really loved was that you could bring them together. You could cross the streams. And I was doing that from the beginning with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And I think the first thing I picked up after that was Ninjas and Super Spies for all the martial arts. Right. You know, and that, I mean, of course. And then I started reading that, and I was like, this is really cool. And then I found out about Heroes Unlimited with all the super soldiers and more science fiction-y instead of more kind of real-world-based uh, espionage stuff like in Ninjas and Super Spies. And, um, and so it just kind of grew from there. And that's one of the things that when I – so for a long time, I, especially while I was in the military, I wasn't doing a lot of role-playing or anything like that. And I got into a lot of, like, tabletop gaming and war gaming with Warhammer 40,000. Um, I mean, I was a – ended up managing a games workshop store, right? But um, when I when I, I got back from the Air Force, one of my buddies is like, dude, please, please, we I want to play some more role-playing games. And uh, we just had so much fun. And and so that's that's it. eventually, I bought everything for GURPS and nothing against GURPS. It was a little too crunchy for me. And that's kind of how I found Savage Worlds, which um, I, I call it a universal system instead of like a generic system because it has a lot of toggles in it that you can toggle on, hey, you want fantasy, or hey, you want more of a swashbuckling feel or a, a gritty noir feel, you can do that. You can do all that with this one rule set. And I think that's part of the reason why Savage Worlds and Rifts are such a good fit. Because if someone's looking for a, a more streamlined gameplay experience, because um, a lot of my friends, we just didn't have time. A lot of my buddies are now in management and have kids and we only had a couple hours to try and get a, a game session in every couple of weeks right um and that's why i think that the, the two systems are such a great fit even though they're very very different thematically they really mesh um and you're you're really new to savage worlds right um yeah what I'm what totally yeah and what struck you about this new incarnation of rifts How, you know it, what do you think about it well, I mean, I, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's shockingly concise and complete. Uh, I'm going to realize you're building on to things, but, uh, 
you know, the Rift world's just just massive. So, right, um, it is massive. But in, 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 in all fairness, I have not actually played Savage Worlds myself yet. Oh um, well, maybe I can yeah, have the honor at some time. Right, I, I I played at at, at with, with with Sean. Yeah. Uh, at a couple of conventions when he was play testing and, and demoing it. Um, but I mean, I've never, I, I haven't run a game or, or played okay, in, gotcha. in something locally here. Um, but yeah, I, I like that the rules are, 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 are fast and fun. I, I like that it, you know, really taps into the cinematic elements because I, I do too, but I mean, it just flat out comes out and says, you know, think in this capacity with, with a film or, or this and that. <laughs> it does, um, that it does, that's yeah. cool. I love some of the uh, adaptations of things like uh, juicers having the blaze of glory power, um, that kind of thing. So it's, yeah, you guys have really captured the, the, the look and feel and, and fun of, of rips and the expansiveness. Because, I mean, as you were saying with different uh, um, Savage World products, you can play all these different genres. I mean, Rifts itself incorporates all those different genres. So you can go to a corner of Rifts where you can play Noir or Cowboys and Aliens exactly. and uh, all kinds of things. So, so it's, again, I think that, that helps make it a, a wonderful blend and companion. Now, now, you guys recently upgraded the original, uh, did expanded a new rules for savage worlds and expanded source books for rift savage worlds yeah that's right so um that and that's when when i got involved was with working on the um the the world books that we just released so this 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 year we just released arcanon mysticism a blood and banes and empires of humanity so the way i would look at these three books is uh, uh sean and robin bircher were uh, headed up, there's a lot of writers that were involved, of course, but they headed up uh, Arcane and Mysticism and Blood and Banes, and I, I worked on uh, Empires of Humanity, and uh, these books, are, are basically we're trying to make sure we got a really good coverage of North America to give everybody the, the statistics they needed for the real big it big ticket stuff in North America because you know uh, one of the things that I think has been really interesting is and we can talk about this more in a second but we, we're not trying to replace Palladium's books right right we, we, go, we come out on the first page of these new supplements and we say this is the like on Empires of Humanity I'm like this is the 20 books I referenced <laughs> to write Empires of Humanity these are the primary references there's other ones too but <laughs> Um, but yeah, so we've got these three new books out, and Arcane and Mysticism is really about Federation of Magic, Magic, Psionics, uh, Psyscape, stuff like that. Blood and Banes is about your Vampire Kingdoms, your Zytikic, your Dinosaur Swamp, uh, and, and some of your darker characters like um, the uh, Knights of the White Rose, uh, the, uh, the, the Shifter... Um, you can wear, role play as a, a vampire or wear uh, a wear cat. Um, so these are different. These are different. The, kind of the anti heroes of the a necromancer. The anti heroes of the Rifts universe, right? That normally um, people would say, are they really good guys, or can you role play as them? You know. Um, and I know some GMs. They're like, well, I don't do vampires in my game. It's like totally cool, but it's there if you want it, and, or to build an NPC, an important character in your campaign with, um, and. Uh, then Empires of Humanity, uh, the one that I primarily wrote, um, and it was the least uh, least complete one when I got the manuscript. It, I, I did a lot of writing. Um, but uh, that one covers um, your your Coalition, Free Quebec, Northern Gun, the New West, uh, a lot of the, just the, the more, I don't know if mundane is the right word because it's all still really high tech and psych psychic powers and all this crazy stuff. But... Uh, you know, Archie three, <laughs> the Sumerians. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what that book primarily covers. And so those are really great. And the other thing that I think that uh, might interest a lot of fans of Palladium products is each one of them has multiple adventures as well as an entire campaign. Uh, we, uh, Savage Worlds calls it uh, a plot point campaign. So we've got these Savage Tales, these one-off or two-off adventures. You can play it in a few weekends with your buddies or... 
um, outlines for entire epic campaigns that I've had a lot of people telling me on the Rifts for Savage Worlds Facebook group, they're Palladium fans, and they enjoy the books for the adventure material, right? They oh, I, I, absolutely. You guys do a great job doing that. Um, and I have to admit, where Palladium itself tends to be a little weak on, on doing canned adventures. Um <laughs> So, so yeah, you guys, I think, are really filling a nice niche. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, Savage Worlds, you know, approaches things a lot differently than a lot of companies. Um, the adventure modules are a little higher level, sort of like your hook, line, and sinker um, type of, of adventure prompts that you might have in a lot of the books. But uh, that is one of the things that I think is a, is a, is a big selling point is that uh, Savage Worlds, we really focus on on quality adventure content and you you read and you review all of it so it's all it all fits riffs canon it all it all fits into the world um and it's and there's some new there's some new stuff in there too for for fans because we have all this stuff that it's all set in 109 pa so when i'm going over the coalition and the state of affairs and their trade ties with northern gun or the New German Republic, uh, it's all updated to 109 PA, and there's even stuff that you and I have gone over to make sure that, hey, this is this is some of the important stuff that happened to the CS Navy. These are some of the important right. repercussions that, like, they've had to move their base to uh, their naval base to to Baton Rouge because Port Horus was was uh, destroyed by Pecos Raiders and stuff. So, um, it's a it's a it's really it's been really it's been a really great experience working with you on all of that and coordinating all of it as a fan um to to be able to add to that lore uh that you and other all the other you know writers that have come before have worked on so that's been really cool and i'm, I'm really glad that people can see these products um one of the big things that's new in this is that rifts for savage worlds um you know, you and I both see it as kind of, we've talked about this, we see it as kind of like alternate timelines. And the only difference when you're reading through all these Rifts for Savage Worlds products is that there's something called the Tomorrow Legion, a group of heroes that are kind of a, uh, an alliance between the Cyber Knights and the Glitter Boy, the, the Brotherhood of Glitter Boy Pilots and the, uh, you know, the the uh, Justice Rangers and different factions like that all coming together under one banner uh, to try and do some good in the world and respond to the, all the different crazy threats um, you know, that P Plato talked about in his warnings and everything uh, that are threatening Rift's Earth. Um, you know, so th we see these as, as, as two timelines that are identical, at, at least a as when they're getting printed, besides the Tomorrow Legion. What do you think about the Tomorrow Legion? I know a lot of fans are like, does does Kevin like the Tomorrow Legion? Is the Tomorrow Legion is that really riffs? Uh, what do you, what what? How do you feel about that? Ah, uh, they stink. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, like you said, I I, I read and approve everything. So uh, obviously, I, I I like them because I keep letting you guys do a ton of stuff with them. I, I think it's a it's a really great idea. Um, I like it. The idea that it's sort of a network of all these other independent groups that have kind of gotten to work together and help each other towards a common cause, even though they may still have their own causes and their own adventures and things that they want to do. But uh, yeah, I, I love the Tomorrow Legion. I thought it was a great idea. And it helps, it helps give the Savage Rift stuff a little bit of a different voice than just parroting the stuff that we've done right and i know with a lot of people uh the adventuring paradigm in in the traditional palladium rifts products you know is that you could be maybe part of a coalition team that stays or goes rogue you could be part of a mercenary company um, and there's all different types of, you could be answering the, uh, 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 you know, the call to heroes, which in, in, in some ways the Tomorrow Legion is, is the idea that Aaron Tarn and Lord Coke of the Cyber Knights and Plato of the Council of Learning, they all kind of get together to, to, to create an organized response, right? Um, but, uh, you know, with that said, is, is Savage Rifts, is it still Rifts? You know, is it, is it, is it canon? Is it Rifts? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and it's, and it's 
it's good. I mean, it's totally true to the original material, and it helps advance different storylines and concepts. So, yeah, it's definitely riffs. Cool. I'm glad to hear you say that. I just, it's official. I've asked Kevin. <laughs> it's riffs. <laughs> It's canon. That's right. But we work really and hard I, on that. I, I don't know if people know understand how much you and I have communicated, right? How much you and the original uh, design team have communicated. How much effort you put into going through all of the material and answering our questions. Um, so I, I, it's kind of funny to see that. You know, I'm obviously seeing that constantly. Um, and then to hear people say, oh, well, you know, I've, I've just heard about stuff like people will post about, Rifts for Savage Worlds products, or say a Kickstarter, sharing it in a group. And I'm not going to name any specific groups. They'll, name, they'll share it with a group online, and then someone will say, "Well, that's that's not Rifts," and they'll take it down, you know, or or you know, oh. get into stuff like that. And I'm like, "That's really <laughs> like this stuff is is we're 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 working we're you're working overtime to try and make sure that this fits the canon and the lore." So, and doing a great job of it. Uh, seriously. Um, and, and that's why I decided to, 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 you know, work with you guys. I, I, I knew that going in, you know, work, you know, talking with Shane and the rest of the crew. Um, and that's the main reason I said, sure, let, let's do this. Cause I knew you guys knew and loved riffs and were going to, you know, work with me and, and build on things. And, you know, I think a lot of people assume because we're two different companies, that you know there must be uh, very little contact or um, you know a certain amount of rivalry or something and you know that's not the case at all so it, it's, it's interesting I, I do kind of get that impression too and it's it's funny because it, it kind of mystifies me after working with you and being a part of all of this because it's it's anything but the truth because we're you know we're promoting your products on Pinnacle's page, we're promoting, you know, the new, the new Palladium, uh, riffs products like, uh, the, the, the new North American, the bestiary and, and all these things that are coming out. And, and we're working with you on getting all the details correct. And, and you're getting excited about everything that we're releasing and saying, you can't wait to see it. And, and then, uh, I think some people think that there's, that it's, that, that there is some sort of rivalry. And that's really funny to me because we work really hard to not step on each other's toes and to make sure that everything meshes, you know? Um, and I've had a lot of fans that, uh, have been coming and saying on, again, on these, uh, these message boards and these groups, and they're saying, I'm a big Palladium fan, but I really appreciate all y'all's uh, hard work on adventure material or the vice versa. I've got the, I've got fans that are like, wait, they're maybe new to savage worlds and, and riffs. And they're saying, wait, there's, there's whole world books and source books. There's, you know, this backlog of 80 plus books that I can go tap into for my game and for background. It goes deeper than just these three new 200 page world books. Uh, and there, and, and we're like, yeah, <laughs> like, go check it out, man. You like juicers, pick up juicer uprising. You know, you want this, pick up that. If you like this, go get that. You're going to, you're going to learn that there's a, there's a whole, we've just scratched the surface in our, in our books. Right. Um, and we we're trying to do it justice, but I mean, th there's great material there and we're not trying to replace that. So that's been a really uh, interesting experience. Um, so a fan, a follow-up question from the fans. Uh, because we have, like I said, we we even have Palladium fans that are, are fans of the Tomorrow Legion. Uh, they ask. This was one of the highest voted uh, questions when I when I when I uh, was doing going through the different questions. They said, "Would you be open to bringing Tomorrow Legion story elements into a Palladium published book?" I think I know yeah, what you say. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, no, I absolutely. In fact, even as we're talking, I, I was thinking that uh, with some of the material that I have coming up, which I, I don't want to blow sure. Sure. Uh, at, at this time, but I'm thinking you're probably the guy who should at least outline it, and I can write it, or you could write it, and definitely put it in. In fact, I've got uh, That'd be awesome. we've got some sort of re-releases we're doing. In fact, this this weekend with. Uh, in conjunction with Gen Con, we are uh, re-releasing um, the Rifts Index 1 and the adventure booklet uh, that came with the Rifts Game Shield that came out in the yeah. late 90s. 
um, with a bunch of extra material. We're calling it uh, the, the Rift's Primer and, okay. and Adventures book. And um, I think in one, so, so I think it's that one that I, I've written like uh, 101 new adventures. Um, oh, wow. There are just, just, just 101 little, like little, it's almost like a table. It's like one through 101. Sure. And they're just hook, line, and sinker kind of condensed uh, right. down. It, it, yeah, kind of. I mean, I wrote a couple new hook, line, and sinkers for it as well. Okay. But in at least one of those 101 adventure ideas, I, I, I mentioned the Tower of Legion. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're already going to be mentioned in, in a book. So there so you go. More there you go. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Well, that's funny. And it's funny because um, I don't know if a lot of people, and this is something that's been interesting as we've talked and gotten to be, I, I, could, I think we've gotten to be kind of friends, haven't we? Uh, Absolutely. And, yeah. And it's it's that's been an interesting uh, thing for me as a fan. And then to get to know you as a person and get chatting with you, uh, you know, about creative ideas, but also about business and all these different things. It's been really cool. Um and so, uh, I, I, well. thank you. It's well, been I, a real pleasure working with you. And, uh, you know, what, what, one of the nice things in working with, with everyone at Pinnacle is that, uh, and I think one reason we get along so well at two companies, I think we both approach our products as a collaborative effort. Right. Um, so it, the bottom line for, for your, your company and my company is to produce the best possible product. It's not about ego. It's not about, you know, bullshit. It's about what the fans are going to enjoy, what's going to make a great gaming experience. That's exactly. the whole point of it. Absolutely. It's, 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 it, it's all about that end experience for the players and the, and the game masters. Right. Um, and, and just, if you just want to read something cool, if you're a Rifts fan of the world and you just want to read a cool book, you know, um, that's, I, I kind of took that approach when, you know, when I was working on Empires of Humanity is I looked at, say, um, Rifts Aftermath, which just kind of touched mm -hmm. on all this different stuff. And I feel like that, that they're, they're more related in a lot of ways because it's, for any, any fan of Rifts, this is, is kind of a catch you up to 109 PA and the state of things. Um, in, in a little more detail. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's been really great working with you. And, and, I'm, I'm, and we've already talked about, and you know, people may be surprised to know that I'm, I'm also very interested in if you have anything that you'd like me to work on with, you know, with Palladium Books, uh, because yeah. I am, I'm actually um, a contractor for Pinnacle Entertainment. Um, they only have a few. It's a small company, kind of like yours. It's a it's a small, it, it, you know, small right. families, you know. Um, and I've been I've been very fortunate to be a part of that family. But uh, right now, my, my you know my current agreement with uh, with Pinnacle and actually between them and my my own company that I started recently uh, is is to work on on the riffs for Savage Worlds products. But that means I, I mean I'm I'm not like tied down. There's no rivalry. We're all kind of working together. And I know. Uh, Shane will say things like, a, you know, rising tide, you know, lifts all ships. So I feel the same way, Church. you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I know he's a little jealous that I get to play in, in one major sandbox because he gets pulled in so many different directions. Just, I'm like, I'm sure you do all the time as well um, with all the different awesome creative worlds that y'all have, have, have dreamt up. Um, well, that's awesome to know that the Tomorrow Legion is actually mentioned already in, 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 in print, uh, coming up very soon for Palladium. I, that surprises me. I, you know, I thought the answer was going to be, you know, the Tomorrow Legion's kind of y'all's timeline, and this is kind of our timeline, but that's interesting to see the Tomorrow Legion is going to crop up. That's really fun. Um, so let's see. We talked about, I have a list of questions here to make sure we, I want to make sure we don't miss anything really juicy that the fans have been asking about. Um, so you know, at, at Pinnacle, we've been really wanting to boost the 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 signal for Rifts fans everywhere about some of Palladian's new Rifts releases. Um, what can you tell us about? I mean, you just mentioned that new kind of starter pack that you've got you've got yeah. brewing. Uh, what are some of the other big things that uh, maybe some of the Savage Rifts fans who uh, need to be aware of that are coming up? Because uh, I mean, I've got that preview edition of like the Titan Robotics and and all that kind of stuff. What else is coming up? 
Uh, actually, we got we got a lot of great things coming up. So, so first of all, the the primer and the index of Volume One uh, will be available next week. Um, we wanted to be able to ship it immediately, but with COVID nineteen, uh, all of our printers because we use like three different places. Um, you know, they're still all short staffed. They're still falling behind it's tough. here and it's there. Their yeah. schedules are long. So uh, I'm just glad they're still around and doing okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we thought we'd have them ready to ship as of today. It looks like it's going to be next Wednesday or Thursday. But on top of that, we have a bunch of really great um, books coming up for, for Rifts and, and for other game lines. Um, you mentioned Titan Robotics. Uh, that book's going to be amazing. We've gotten comic book artist Stephen Cummings, oh, as well as wait. Chuck Bolt and some other people to do art. In fact, here are... Because uh, I'm stoked. I read through that, and okay. I was just like, this is great. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Um, that That's one. That's another. Um, you know, Chuck has really been... Uh, pulling out all the stops um you know it's uh it, it's it's pretty cool there's a bunch more but i mean i don't know how much people want to see and um that book is will be out certainly by the end of this year um hopefully in in the fall we've got uh, riffs bestiary volume two that we're working on it's going to be pretty that. amazing i really enjoyed it, the first one well Thanks. Yeah, I had a blast. I've been having a ton of fun um, just kind of readdressing and, and going back and, and updating and sprucing up uh, a bunch of the characters and concepts and, and monsters and ideas, characters. Uh, people can expect to see a lot more of that. Um, so another book that I'm, I'm wrapping up, uh, I should go to the printer hopefully by the end of next week, is... Uh, Rifts Coalition Manhunters, nice. which a lot of people don't, don't know anything about or, or don't know much about, which I think you were about to say <laughs> that you hadn't heard of it or you don't know what it is. No, I'm not familiar uh, with it. Yeah, so, so and unfortunately, I didn't think about it at the time. I kind of forgot that Palladium had done a uh, licensed source book with a company called Myrmidon Press. Yes, the and they came Manhunter, out with, yeah. Yeah, Rift's Manhunter. So there's some confusion. A lot of people think it's just a redo of that or has something to do with that. And, and it doesn't. It's, it's completely unrelated. It's, it deals with um, a secret division within Cyber Battalion and the Coalition of States uh, that are just badass psychics. And nice. their, their main job, they're, they're sort of like, in some ways... They're, they're kind of the policemen of the coalition in that if someone is engaging with DBs or mages or they think they're engaged in treacherous activity or, or involved with the black market, um, it's the manhunters who go in and, you know, find out if that's true. And more to the point, they're, they're kind of... Uh, assassins basically if you've been earmarked as a traitor the manhunters are dispatched to put an end to you and, and they're just they're, they're super patriots so there's no hey sean roberson maybe there's a bit of misunderstanding here nope if you're on a hit list your head explodes while you're eating dinner one day and uh the <laughs> end. and the people go what the hell this happened and so, in a lot of ways, the, the, the Manhunters are, are, are ghosts who are just kind of coming out, um, being more known to the public due to the, uh, the Minion War. Um, gotcha. Because being psychic, they're, they're highly motivated to uh, destroy the supernatural. They, they, can, they can feel it. They can feel the evil. Same thing of Dog Boys and Kill Hounds. It's all covered in this book. It's pretty freaking epic. I think people are going to... Be really surprised by this book. There's some new psionics. Uh, I, I address some of the old psionics and point out certain other applications for it. Um, so, uh, so that's going to be great. Um, it's been hugely delayed, but we're still coming out with the disavowed, right. which is another. I, I, I'm excited about that one. Uh, yeah. 
And I think that one's going to just flat out blow people's minds. I, I think uh, CS Manhunters, people go, yeah, this really feels like Coalition. Um, we can see how they've been operating for decades without anyone knowing. The disavowed people are going to go, holy crap, where is this going? Uh, and it's going to be great. And, and then, of course, we're going to come out with uh, um, the uh, CS uh, Arsenal. Um, Chuck has a bunch of great concept art for that already. And again, I've got a bunch of other excellent artists lined up uh, to work on that one. In fact, I, I need to assign some art to uh, a couple of folks. Uh, and then we have Rifts and Arca in, in the pipeline as well. That manuscript's in. We did a raw edition of it. Um, it's, it's people like the raw edition, but felt there should be more to it and they're going to get it, nice. uh, in, including sort of a Cthulhu-esque, uh, in, 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 at the mountain of madness kind of, uh, element to it. Nice. nice. Uh, and that's some of the ideas. I, you know, one of my problems is I'm sort of an ID, 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 ID can't speak an idea factory I, I i just everything gives me ideas and, and i like to talk and i am I'm, I'm a fan of our stuff i'm a fan of our game lines so the problem is when i get these great ideas and i'm excited about something i'll be like hey let me tell you about this new cool thing <laughs> three years later they're still waiting for the damn thing so i i don't want to talk about some of the other the big things sure. we have planned, but we sure, have some, but some. Those are some really... of the things actually like on the near horizon that are incoming. Yes. That fans can keep an eye yeah. out for. Well, that's cool, and it, and it sounds like we've got you know between Titan Robotics and then the 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 best Jerry's um, that are coming out for North America. That those are those are some of the ones, and then the, this introductory pack, um, and that sounds like a lot of fun because you know I, I encourage any any Savage Rifts fans to hey you know what. The more adventure material you can get, the more adventure tables and random encounter tables. Hey, it'll even include the Tomorrow Legion. You can you can throw those into your game, right? And have a lot of fun with it because it's riffs. It's all it's all riffs. So that's that's oh absolutely, and vice versa. And one of the things I want to point out about Savage Worlds is, and again, it's another area that that we we don't do a lot with, and that's um, maps. You guys do some some great maps. We do. We have uh, uh, both of your adventures. Yeah, all our that material contractors are great. And then played in our world and, and vice versa. Everything mixes and matches really well. Thank you. I really appreciate that because we worked. Um, so we so Pinnacle, a lot of people may know, we contract through Sigil Entertainment to do um, manage our, a lot of our art and graphic design and maps, virtually all of it, right? And so... Uh, I think all of it, I think everything. So um, everything I've ever done has been working through them and they're really awesome. And I, I'll, I'll tell you that, uh, I mean, the, the the maps, Alita is so patient. She works on me with these maps because there's just so many books to reference and so many things to go through. But we have worked really hard to try and uh, to, to create some beautiful maps. And I know the first design team, the original design team for the first edition of Rifts for Savage Worlds, came out with a beautiful North America map. And when we were coming out with these new books, we expanded it to cover more of Canada and the and Mexico and give uh, an update so that players could see what's going on, right? And uh, we also added, uh, one of the things that I was really excited about was adding borders so that people could see you know, the coalition will claim Arkansas, but they don't control Arkansas. When you read in, when you read the material, they control up to this river, right? And it's it's very clear, but it's in one spot in one book or two books, and people miss that sometimes. And so that's one of the things that, uh, and and you'll forget. You're like, wait, where was this? And so to get it all on a map even helps me because now it's easy to see. Okay, this is that weird spot, you know, between northern Missouri and southern Arkansas, C.S. El Dorado, where it, the coalition may claim it, but they claim, technically they claim everything ever held by the American Empire, right? So that it's really just, uh, it's, it's really just a, a claim in name um, as a political move, kind of like Texas, where they don't control the Texas Freelands, they don't control the Pecos Empire. Um, 
So that's been a lot of fun. And then trying, just trying to get everything right because after the great cataclysm and between all the different writers and, and, you know, 30 years of material, just making sure we're trying to fit the dots on the map. And one of the things I really appreciate about working with you and Wayne is that, uh, y'all would come back and say, Hey, we really like this map. The dot for Chai Town or the dot for, for Lone, Lone Star, it needs to move a little bit. It's actually just next to where you think it is. You know, we've got, and so that's been really fun. And then updating, for instance, uh, the Baton Rouge uh, naval base and the map and the exactly what areas of that Louisiana coastline are underwater um, has been, you know, just little, little adding little details and, 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 and stuff like that has just been, to me, really fun. And I hope the players uh, enjoy it. Um, and yeah, check it out if you're, if you're a Palladium uh, fan. And you like you want a, a really cool, awesome map? Maybe you should come check out some of the stuff that uh, you can get on the the Pinnacle Entertainment Group's website. You know, we've got some. We did it, um, them as a a, a one off print run to promote the new releases. So there's only so many that might be available. Um, but yeah, definitely we we we've got that and check them out. We've got some cool battle maps if you want to use some battle maps with ley lines and everything on them. So all types of cool stuff. Um, Let's see. Uh, one of the things that, you know, you've got all these new things coming out and some people might be curious. I'm currently working on Atlantis and the Demon Seas, which is going to cover Atlantis as well as um, the Lemurians and the New Navy and Tritonia and the Nautil and, and stuff like that. Uh, basically all your seafaring stuff so, to try and get that into a good spot so that we can cover all of that material in one big 200 page book. Um, and then keep moving on with world books in the Savage Rifts line of products. And again, um, we've already been coordinating about some really cool stuff. I think people will be stoked to hear about um, with uh, some of the updates for what happened to the legacy of, of Ironheart armaments and the Ironheart Avengers. So that'll be really fun. And that is that is Rifts. That's lore. Uh, and so that's going to be a really great update. I think people will enjoy because I, I get a lot of questions about them. Um, from, from a lot of our fan community for some reason. Um, one of the big things that we've also got uh, people asking about, though, is these are, and these, you know, it's funny because you can play Savage Rifts and still, if you want, do the Minion War. We've got the core demons for both uh, Hades and Dival in um, the new books. I think most of them are in Blood and Banes, right? So we've got both of that. We've got both of them with, you know, uh, like the rock, uh, Shasa and the, uh, uh, the, the Alu demon. And then we've also got, uh, a, um, one of the, what is it? Uh, the demons, the, the satyr looking ones, well, uh, the devil, we've got a devil oh. and also a fiend, right? So you could, you've got some of the basic conversions you'd need if you wanted to play some of the minion war. Um, and, and our fan community, the primarily the Savage Rifts uh, community is where I did this poll. They're asking, what's next after the Minion War? And I don't know if you want to answer that or not, um, but, uh, but they, 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 it was, that was the top question. Yeah, I, I, have, I have no doubt of that. I, I just want to say that uh, you're, you're right. All, it's, easy, it's easy, fairly easy to adapt our stuff to yours and vice versa. And, and I encourage people to do that as well um as far as what comes after the minion war um <laughs> I, I think uh i think people will be astonished and delighted and i can't really say more than that well i know when you you mentioned some of it to me at gen con last year and we had a chat about it at first you were like are you excited and i was dude i had i was just poker facing it because we had just met and i was I didn't want to start jumping around like a giddy schoolboy, um, <laughs> but yeah, we've chatted about some of it, and I'm I, I think that people will be really excited about the stuff that's coming up in the future. Um, I, I, I it's been thirty yeah, years. I, I, but I, I, I think Rift, the future of Rifts, is 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 very bright. I I, I do too, and, and in fact, everyone's reaction when, when I I tell them what what's coming is is that giddy. Christmas morning, holy moly, I can't believe it, this is amazing kind of reaction. And, and I don't want to overhype it or, or sure. just throw out a lot of sure. bull, but, or hyperbole, but, you know, it's, 
it's going to be truly epic. We've been uh, working on it for about three years now. And, uh, yeah, it's it's going to be truly mind-blowing. And, you know, part of what I want to do, too, is I want to – I kind of want to level the playing field for, for, for everybody. So if new people come in, new and old people will feel like they're at the same junction, I think, when we're done with all this. And, I think uh, that would be really cool. Yeah, it's going to be epic. <laughs> <laughs> it is. It I, I is. Wish I'm, I'm pretty stoked right about now, it. i got a bunch of stuff i got to do before Sure, uh, we can do that. So, and in fact, the disavowed and, uh, rich man hunters and heroes of humanity and, and a bunch of these things are, uh, they're sort of leading up planting to, the seeds and yeah. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how obvious that'll be, but the, the next phase will, people will go back and go, Holy crap. They, they were hinting at stuff and, you know, giving us little sneak reveals the whole time. So, yep. <laughs> yeah. It's been interesting too, because, um, you know, when we've had conversations about it and then we were talking, uh, the other day and you're like, Oh yeah. And this idea that went from our conversation, I thought about this and I was like, wow, that's cool. I've helped to influence, you know, the, the, the progression of that. Um, and uh, oh, yeah. it's, it's, man, it's really cool stuff. And, and I think that's a lot of fun too, is to see what's coming to build towards these different things. Um, that's one of the things that uh, people have asked about the future progression of the timeline of Savage Rifts. Since I've been clear that, you know, with a lot of the hardcore fans, they know that you and I have, have, have had discussions and we, we see it as two different timelines. So we are, we are also, and we, you and I have discussed it and I know that you, you thought it was a lot of fun. Um, so I think people will be able to see that there's, there's going to be, I think there's going to be a lot of different ways that, and I think it fits riffs that if you have these different timelines, these different plot lines that people can experience, uh, that's so riffs to have alternate dimensions and things like that. Um, but uh, that's, I think that's, that's uh, you know, building up to those things and then letting players see how the world can change and grow, um, I think is, 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 is very satisfying. And, and, and again, I think we both agree that that's part of the experience we want to provide, right? Um, it makes oh, yeah. it feel like a Absolutely. living, breathing world. Um, yeah. Let's see. So, and, and in fact, if I can interject, sure. something, yeah, go ahead. I, I really, something I really need to mention because it it'll play a, uh, it plays sort of a off camera role now, but it'll be taking a much more front and center role in future books. Is is the kingdom of Laszlo? Um, we're working on that, that book as well. In fact, it'll probably be two or three books based on, on Laszlo because there's just so much going there. Laszlo is our good guy city of, uh, or kingdom of magic that is sort of the counterpoint to the, uh, wicked Federation of magic. Right. Um, you know, it's just Laszlo sort of strives for ideals, a more I idealistic society and, you know, whether they can pull that off or not is, uh, you know, time will tell, but, uh, yeah. So a lot of that, that, and I just wanted to mention that because lots and lots of people have, have for years have been asking, when are we going to get a Laszlo source book? And it, it's, it's coming. <laughs> awesome. And I, I, I've, I've already told you, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that and getting my hands on that material as soon as I can, because yep. I think it'd be really fun if when that's coming out that we could do some releases or maybe an adventure module um, because that's one of the things I, I forgot to mention, you know, the things that we're working on for the future of Rifts for Savage Worlds is um, working on world books to that a lot of times are going to be just bringing everything up to date, you know, and expanding a little bit on what's already there in the canon um, and the already printed Rifts material, but we're also working on adventure modules. And so we've got a coalition adventure module this week coming up in the future. We've got another one that uh, I'm working on with the team. And so um, we're going to be having these adventure modules coming out. Um, and so it'd be really fun if we could do, if we could do maybe a simultaneous like, or, or near simultaneous like adventure module that comes out sometime around the same time to kind of uh, bring, bring, you know, again, get the fans able to have fun with the new Palladium books and have fun with the, the, the Savage Worlds adventure material. I think that'd be really cool. Um, so 
on the same kind of question, this was the second most popular question, very close in popularity with our, our group. Um, right now, uh, Kevin, I am perfectly happy fleshing out ri the Rift's Earth and working on some adventure material. Um, but fans keep asking a variant of the question about dimension books and dim other dimensions and things like that. Uh, and so they asked, they said, would you be open to allowing Peg to a, a Pinnacle Entertainment Group to adapt Wormwood, Phase World, or other dimension books for Savage Worlds? Um, and uh, that, yeah, that we'll, we'll start with that question. There's a, there's a similar related question that I'll ask uh, next. But but yeah, what I, I know those are all separate IPs, right? Those are different IPs than Rift's Earth. And so, uh, what is you know, what do you think about that, and what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. So so they would just have to be separate. You know, from a business end of things, they would just have to be separate individual deals um like like wormwood and scrapers versus uh size uh, not sizescape but uh phase world right you know phase world has sort of a series of related books right so so that gives you more material and and would cover a, a wide a wider range but yeah we i don't think i have a problem with you know considering that in the future absolutely it's funny because from our conversations i didn't think it would be a problem you know but if we ever wanted to do that but people keep asking and i'm all, my my canned answer has been well if we really want to do that well, i'm we got plenty to to work on right now but if we ever really want to do that i don't think that, that we couldn't come to some sort of agreement i mean uh i don't think so either I, really I easy to work with and i know that uh, shane and the team and everybody just loves i remember when i first met you jody walked me over to the booth at gen con and we'd already talked on the phone we'd already emailed and stuff but afterwards uh you know but i i heard some for some reason people think oh you know kevin is maybe tough to work with i think it really comes down to your your very uh you you carefully manage your setting that you've built and i don't think there's anything wrong with that but we met and i was just like man kevin is really cool he's really fun to chat with and jody's like right <laughs> she's like i don't know why people are afraid of him but but i i, I think you're great and and and, and i I've, I've only had a very positive experience working on all these different materials with you um, so yeah, that's really cool to know. Um, the next question is, uh, would you be, and they said the way they phrased it, they said, you know, if it was, whether it was something in house at Pinnacle or like, it sounded like they were trying to say like a licensed, cause I don't know if you know how Pinnacle entertainment licenses, uh, Savage Worlds uh, through the ACES program, uh, to, to, to create uh, licensed content, um, based on their rules. Um, people are asking, what about other Palladium book settings like, say, the Mechanoids or Palladium Fantasy or Beyond the Supernatural? Is that something that you'd be open to as well? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, one, one of the things we got going yet. So, I think, so I don't want to get into too much my, my, my reputation online. Oh, I, I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> but, but I mean, nothing I think, negative. I, I think a lot of that came from, you know, people who were disgruntled with me or people who we tried working together and it didn't work out. And then, so then they have to like, you know, g crap on me and, and whatever. So what you guys are, are discovering is if, you know, if I'm working with someone and they want to do all kinds of weird shit that I think doesn't belong in, in the world or doesn't fit mm -hmm. canon or doesn't build on what's already there. Or, and it's just plain bad or stupid then I'm on them all the time saying, you can't do this. You can't do that. Right. I think that's where I think be really frustrating, right? Right. And, and, and I'm frustrated. They're frustrated. And the problem and you and I talked about this sort of is, and I, again, I think you and pinnacle in general and, and me, we take a similar approach. So for example, when palladium did Robotech and teenage mutant Ninja turtles, we wanted to breathe that world to life. We didn't want to make it ours. We didn't want to change it in some dramatic way so we can say, ha, ha, I did that. We wanted to breathe life to what the fans knew and loved. And that's how I approach licenses. And that's how I kind of expect licensors or licensees rather of our properties to do the same thing. And Pinnacle does that. Right. So knowing that now and having worked with you guys now, I'd be 
happy to discuss, you know, licenses for, for anything that Pinnacle might be interested in down the road. Um, you guys do a great job. I'm happy with you. I like what, what you do. The quality is great. The art, the, the writing, I have no complaint. So, yeah, I'd be open to consider anything that Pinnacle might be interested in. You know, uh, Kevin, I really appreciate that. And, and uh, it, it, we did have that conversation, and we talked about that for a while when we were kind of discussing setting up this interview and testing out the webcam. And then we just stopped, talked for like, I don't know, three hours or something. But uh, if, if the viewers can't tell, uh, we can chat. But, uh, but yeah, yeah. It's, it, I think a lot of it is, is making sure that you have, um, well, and sometimes it's just compatible ideas. Um, yeah. with a setting or a property and it's it might be hard because riff seems like it can be everything but uh there is a specific there are specific themes and uh and 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 tropes and and different things like that that if you don't get them right well it's not it's not riffs and as the creator maybe you can feel that more easily than someone who's interested in in li in, in in creating um you know you know, extra lore, right. Or expanded lore. Yep. Um, but it's, it's, it, it, it's, it's been interesting because at, through our discussions, I think you and I've come to realize more and more that we really see eye to eye on the world yeah. of riffs. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of surprising to me. I always hoped that, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I, I've, I've, I felt very, uh, what would you call it? I've been relieved through our conversations because I feel like, okay, okay. I haven't been off base. Uh, I, I think I actually get it. Um, and then you and me both, brother, because, you know, whenever you enter into a license, you have no idea really what you're walking into. Right. Uh, um, like I said, sometimes people do a great job. Sometimes it's mediocre. Sometimes it's just horrific. So it, it, it's always a little scary. And uh, so I felt, I felt the same way where it's like, I hope they're going to do a good job. Um, you know, I knew some of the people initially involved uh, very well. So I, I felt very comfortable um, on, on that front. And then I was hopeful that Shane would bring in other good people who would feel the same and, you know, do a great job. And, and he did. And you, and you do. And you especially, like, like you said, I think we're very much on the same page. And, and part of that page, I think, too, is we're always looking for things that'll be fun and entertaining for the fans. We're always looking for ways to push the envelope to surprise our audience. And those are all important to me rather than here's a new city that just regurgitates Japan or the coalition or these yeah. guys, or those guys, you, you know, and I, I see that all the time and that's not a slam on people who may enjoy that for their own games and stuff. That's great. You know, do whatever you want, but for stuff that I want to see in, you know, produced in public, you know, I don't want to have 20 clones of the same city or the same concept, whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I want to always be pushing the envelope here and, 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 you know, see that with our license, so licensees as well. So, uh, and, and Pinnacle does that and you do that. So I'm, Thanks, I'm very, very pleased. Awesome. Awesome. Well, that's good to know. Uh, again, I, I, it makes me very happy, uh, as, as a fan, you know? Um, and, uh, so that's been really great. Um, let me see. Uh, this is a question that was pretty popular too. Um, sort of on the same front, does Palladium Books plan to publish more novels in the future? Why or why not? Um, again, I think a lot of it is a matter of finding good, good writers who are willing to accept our crappy pay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um you know, that's, the, I think that that's the real issue. Uh, we have, uh, we actually have um a, a novel that that one of my uh, artists one of my map makers who, who also is is a writer i think he kind of produced and, and even released on his own website and he said hey would you guys be willing to release this as a pdf and we're, i'm like let me read it and it's pretty darn good so we're like yeah and then we're also going to be uh doing some uh uh, collecting a novel that was written that was serialized in the Rifter. And then, yeah, if there's other, you know, writers out there who want to try their hand at writing a Rifts novel um, and, and are willing to follow and build on what 
already exist rather than some whacked out new thing that makes no sense, <laughs> please submit them. And in fact, you and I have talked about you writing yes, a have. novel, which yes, I'm very excited about. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was, and that's, uh, I didn't know if you were going to mention that because I was like, I wonder if he'll mention the fact that I already pitched a novel to you. Um, <laughs> so that's something I've like been it. working on in the it. background. Well, thanks. Yeah, and it's, for me, it was one of those things where, well, I think it, it really goes back to our conversation because what I, when I talked to you about it, one of the things we talked to, we talked about for, I don't know, at least I think an hour is, is, you know, how I was trying to step people into the world of riffs through the plot line and hit the right highlights and the right high points, it, it, you know. Um, so I would suggest that anybody that's, uh, that is interested in doing that, um, you know, if you, if you respect the, the material that's come before, if you respect the themes and are trying to fi figure out the right way to tell the best story possible, I think, yeah, contact Kevin, because uh, I'd love to read uh, more riffs novels and fiction, and I think there should be more of it, um, and I, you know, I wish I had more time to write it. <laughs> that, that, that's my problem too. I, I actually have ideas for uh, four novels uh, my, myself, and the problem is time. I, I don't have, I, I don't have time. I, you know, I think fans. Well, I know fans would rather me do world books, source books for any number of our game lines rather than write a novel. Because I, I talked to a, a very dear super fan. And, and told him some of my ideas and things I want to do. And, and he said, gee, that, that, that's great. But he said, it's sort of like, you know, Michelangelo saying the, the, the artist, not the turtle. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Have to specify. You know, saying, hey, I got all these ideas for the other cool things that you hear and say, yeah, I, gee, Michelangelo, I'd love to hear that. But how about finishing the Sistine Chapel, man? <laughs> Exactly. So, so I, I I need to finish a bunch of, of, of stuff that I know gamers will will, will love in, in the way of you know you know new RPGs and you know a ton of new source books and adventure books. So uh, yeah, and you know, and, and uh, the other thing I would say is is if you are a fan and you want novels, well, hey, have you read the novels that have already been published? Have if you really are a fan of, of, of X Y Z, not really, but if you're a fan of it, make sure you've you've. Yeah read or maybe it's been 20 years maybe go reread uh some of the stuff that's already been published because there's a lot of material out there that i remember um when i was going through some of this stuff for the books i was like i totally forgot about this snippet this really cool snippet or this this cool uh mercenary company or or this conversation between archie and hagon or you know different things like that and it was it's been a lot of fun when i go through these products well uh, you know the pre-existing material just to experience it over again um but uh, I have a, a related um, question with that. A lot of fans, they, they, they said that uh, they've re enjoyed the revised editions of some of the early books, like the revised Source Book 1, revised Vampire Kingdoms, Rift's Ultimate Edition. I know the Federation Magic was revised. Um, will other books be getting the same kind of update? And I mean, this kind of ties into the same thing. Do you want me to revise previous material? Or do you want me to keep forging new paths? Uh, but yeah, that was one of the questions that the fans asked. That's very kind of just part of that same kind of conversation. Yeah, um, you're certainly going to see elements of that in new books okay. where we kind of go back and uh, address um, certain characters and issues and, and storylines. Um, for sure, we may do some uh, additional updated and revised other books. I mean, the Rift Speech Jerry is sort of that. It, it collects everything plus updates and revises certain things with a certain percentage of, exactly. of, new, of new stuff. So, yeah, I think you're going to continue um, to see those kind of things. Um, I also wanted to mention, since you brought up the novels, that uh, the original three novels have been cleaned up and made available as PDFs on drivethroughrpg.com. Oh, great. Okay. And one of the things we're releasing again in in, con in, in concert with, with, with Gen Con through Palladium is the third Rifts novel, which has been out of print for a long, long time, I mean, years and years, uh, will be available as a printed book as well as of next week. 
Yeah, because it was it was Sonic Boom, Deception's Web, and what was the third one? Do you remember? Uh, Treacherous Awakenings. Treacherous Awakenings. Yeah. So and they're really good. I mean, the guy who wrote them. I mean, he he was a young super fan with you know natural writing talent, and those novels are. Are, are pretty darn good, and, and each one I think gets gets a little better. The third novel is the conclusion of that storyline, and it's I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I, and I've read them a couple of times in the past, you know, twenty years or whatever since it came out. Um, yeah, I remember reading it in high school, and then reading it again a couple of years ago. Um, and it's got a lot of really cool world building material that uh, it, it really gives you a feel for. What is it like inside a chai town? Yeah. What is it like on the frontier? That's one of the things, the aspects about it that I really, really enjoyed was that it brought the world of rifts to life. Um, so uh, a- another question we've got, and I get asked this stuff constantly. You don't have to answer or you can. I know we've had different conversations about some of this stuff. Um, what about, especially with everything going on right now, what about uh, virtual tabletop support like Fantasy Grounds or Roll20 for Rifts for Savage Worlds and or for uh, Palladium Rifts? Yeah, yeah I, 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 that's something we, we have gotten a lot of uh, inquiries from fans uh, about Fantasy Grounds as well. And uh, I, I certainly see us being able to do something um, through Pinnacle and, and, you know, with, with Savage Rifts. Um, I, I think that's definitely going to happen. Yep. Uh, and then, yeah, we want to explore doing our version of Rifts and, uh, you know, possibly other game lines through Fantasy Grounds as well. I'm, I'm, and for me, a, a big part of the problem is, is just finding a time. Sorry, I didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, 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 no. It's just it's just finding the time to, to explore all these things. Just like we'd like to do miniatures, um, we'd like to expand in other areas, but you know we haven't had such a great experience with miniatures doing them ourselves. And uh, you know Carmen Belair wanted to do a miniature uh, board game and came up with some freaking amazing designs that he put a ton of his own money into um, that he wanted to produce uh, a few years back, and and just things didn't pan out and. Um, so, so we're looking at possibly doing something with, with his sculpts and, and okay. then, uh, so people can look for, that's one of the things I get asked a lot. So there are plans for, for, uh, Palladium to be putting together some sort of, of, uh, miniatures in availability sometime in the future. I, I wouldn't call them plans. I'd call it a desire. <laughs> Just like we, I worked out a deal with Carmen to release the, uh, the glitter boy that, that he had done. Uh, actually, he, he did two. The other one's pretty pretty rad. Um, we might release that down the road. Um, so so we're gonna. Re- we're, that's already available right now. In fact, um, that people can buy uh, is the new Glitter Boy, which is a beautiful resin. It's almost three inches tall. It's gorgeous. That's great. Yeah, Carmen did a great job on those. Uh, well, I should say his sculpture. But I mean, Carmen was like art directing and, sure. and, and sure. all of that. Uh, for for his company and then uh, so I mean I think a licensee would probably do a better job with miniatures than Palladium could whether it was tied to a game or just miniature releases or not but but I don't know I mean uh, yeah that's and that's one of the questions I get a lot too is because people have asked about miniatures before and I say well you know Palladium is from what I understand from the contract, Palladium's reserved those rights. But people ask, you know, would you be interested in letting Pinnacle do figure flats or pawns or, 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 or even miniatures or something like that? Because um, we do have, you know, we have the we do have a lot more hands and contractors that are more familiar with that type of stuff. Is that something you'd be uh, willing to, to talk about? I, I mean, I'm always willing to talk about anything. Um, a- absolutely. Um, you know, we were also at one point approached by, uh, Steve Jackson games. Okay. Um, yeah, I know Steve and, and, and I, especially Phil and, uh, they, at one point for, for off and on for years, we've talked about possibly doing a, uh, uh, riffs, um, munchkin. And, ah, and, I would yeah, love it. Awesome. Um, 
And, and then they, they also mentioned some interest in possibly doing miniatures. But you know, that's another company. I, I think a lot of I think a lot of fans think a lot of these companies are, are, are bigger than they really are. And uh, there's a lot so, of heart in you know, it. A lot more heart than I think a lot of people realize. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. So, you know, I think just, you know, Steve Jackson has had his hands full with a lot of other things and more pressing matters and um, stuff that would be, you know, for sure sellers. And, um, but, you know, that's been kind of floating around out there. And, yeah, there's some possibilities of maybe doing some other, um, you know, things with, with Pinnacle. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to people, uh, anybody, uh, especially real companies. I, this is not a slight on, on fans, but sure. everyone has great ideas. Everyone has desires. They love stuff, but you know, I'm mostly looking for <laughs> established Com- companies, companies to come with to the track place. record of, 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 right. Exactly. Who, who, who has experience doing these kind of things. Um, so yeah, I, I would love to see miniatures come out, especially these days. Miniatures are, are more and more popular than ever. Um, you know, I was never a miniature guy myself so much. <laughs> so, uh, even though, I mean, I love toys and I love having miniatures yeah. and have somebody paint them for me. Cause I'm not going to do that microscopic <laughs> painting detail. I People worked for Gat Workshop. Quiet. I gave painting classes. I painted up massive, massive really? armies. Yeah. I was so into it for the longest time. And I even, um, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but it's kind of a side tangent thing. Um, Games Workshop, uh, their managers, and especially uh, when, when you get really involved with some of the different um, games days, their big conventions. Um, I, you know, I went in and saw the production facilities. Uh, I don't know if you know Simon Lucas. He's the executive producer at Pinnacle. He's a pretty quiet guy. Um, but he used to work for Games Workshop as well um, in, in uh, more like the production side of things. But yeah, uh, it's interesting because the miniatures are not cheap or easy to produce. And there's, there's, a, you get, it's, it's a, it can be, it's getting to be better with newer technology, but it can be um, a big upfront cost. And if things go wrong, it can be a big liability. And I don't know if everyone really understands that as much as they should. And we don't need to go into any of that type of stuff, especially, but, but just, the, I don't know if the fans understand that. And that's why I say something like maybe, um, you know, figure flats or, uh, or pawns that you could punch out and then put on a stand or something. Maybe those are things that we could look at too, where you could get a high quality of art. It'd be very, um, very, very affordable for players to get a lot of them at once maybe. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to Shane. I'll talk to our, our peeps. I know uh, Sigil Entertainment does a gr- lot of great work and and uh, maybe, we'll, maybe we'll see if we can come back to you sometime soon with some ideas. Um, but uh, I think the fans would really enjoy that if we can. Um, and you know we're also a, a, a small a small company. Um, no. and so, you know, we, we, I think pinnacle and palladium, you know, in their own way, each kind of punches above their weight, even like Steve Jackson games. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the, I, I think the fans will be really excited to hear that. And, and part of it is, is like, I think part of it's it, you, as you mentioned, you've been so happy with all the other stuff we've done that now you're willing to say that. Right. Um, and so I think that's, uh, something for people to understand as well. Um, if, if you're, if you're more, um, if you haven't done a lot of stuff yet, you don't have a proven track record. It's, 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 it's not that you're trying to be mean or dismissive. It's that, and I think that happens a lot with, like we talked about with some of these people wanting to come in and, and collaborate or, or, or be part of the process. Um, and, and if they can understand that, maybe that'll help, help them a little bit to understand why different things happen the way they do or not. Um, but, uh, okay, well, that's, that's, that's cool. That's exciting. Um, you know, we, 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 I knew we could have talked about this offline, but, uh, a lot of this stuff I thought, you know what, I'll just, I'm not trying to put you on the spot. I gave you a list of questions beforehand, right? So you knew what was, what was possibly coming. Um, but I, I, I thought it'd be fun to just kind of ask you and, and let you kind of answer me and the fans at the same time. Um, sure. so I really appreciate you being willing to do that. Um, some of the, the qu- other questions that we got on the forum and just to finish off what I've brought from the forums and from our fans, um, what are some of the strategies that you would suggest for pe- keeping campaign uh, campaigns fresh for players that are overly familiar with the background material? I think they're talking from the point of view of 
players that have maybe like me been playing riffs for 30 years, I have some answers, but what would you say to that first? Yeah. So, 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 so that, that's always tricky. Um, so I think the big thing is to listen to your players. Um, meaning, you know, keep your ear out for things that they would like to encounter or discover or explore. Um, and then you really touched on, on, on a good thing earlier, which was, um, going back and reading those books, I know we all think we know those books inside and out. And, and I'm sure there are some folks who do and certain books that y you, you do. But again, I, I, I wrote these things and, and I'll go back, as you had mentioned, and, and, and reread stuff. And I'm like, oh, wow, I, I completely forgot about <laughs> this thread or, or, you know, this looming threat that we've just hinted at and never went anywhere is with. Right. Um, and then also, you know, I, I do this when I write all the time, um, whether it's brand new, totally brand new stuff, or whether it's uh, uh, me going back and, and readdressing older material. And, and that's to look, try to look at it with, with, with new eyes and think about ways that you could spin it in a different, exciting, fun way, you know, without breaking your, your campaign or, or the rules or, or anything like that. Um, and I find that that really helpful. I, I, we talked about this a little bit in regard to writing is when I'm writing or game designing or even just creating a, a, an adventure or campaign for, for myself and my players, I'm always asking myself all kinds of questions um, why is this? And if this is the case, then what ramification might it have on uh, this or that? And, and that always leads me to new stories and, and, and new ideas that, that, to take things. Right. So that would be my advice. Yeah. And I, I have a couple of things I'll say, and I, it just kind of occurred to me while you were talking. Um, one of the things that I'd say is, you know, make it your own. I know this happened when I play, I would play, uh, my friends and I, we would play the West End Star Wars role-playing game, the D6 one, right? Um, and one of the questions we had to come up with really quickly is the Game Master, one of the campaigns we played, he wanted to make sure that nothing conflicted with any of the Star Wars movies. Oh. Right. So, for instance, he you, and, and it, we're talking like you see when we when we participated in the battle at the Death Star, he's like, "All right, man. Well, remember, there's only two X wings and a Y wing and the Millennium Falcon that are seen flying away from the Death Star. So, if you're not in one of those, you're dead." <laughs> you know, and stuff like that. And, and so, but it, the the question really is is okay when we're and this is a big thing for session zero that a lot of people do, right? Uh, what 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 type of gameplay? You know, are, are the players explorers? Are they are they slayers? Are are they experiencers? You know, um, are they you know social? Um, so these are the different types of players you might have. Find out what kind of themes and stuff they want to do, but also decide. Okay, are, are, are is this? Are we going to make sure that we don't? You know, is the Coalition or the Federation of Magic, are those characters inviolate? Or could you end up assassinating, assassinating Joseph Prosek II, you know? Or... But my answer is yes. We're not talking about something public going out to the world that's canon. So We're talking about fun. your game. Exactly. And if you have some epic idea or adventure or your, or, or your players, and I love that when this happens, when your players come up with some brilliant plan, Hell yeah, run with it. Do yeah, whatever. It's exactly. your game. We're creating the outline of this world and stuff to inspire you, but it's your game. You should be the guys who have total control, do whatever you want. If in, in my, What I always tell people is if you, the game master, and your players are having fun, then you're doing a great job. Exactly. Don't yeah, and I've, I've, I've had players that say, well, they took everything and then they've even altered. Maybe, you know, Lord Dunson is, has already died or this other thing has happened. And so they basically turned their game into an alternate timeline, right? Sure. Um, the other two yeah. things that I will say that I think can be very strong is Rifts 
especially if and i say this to savage rifts players too if you enjoy this part of the new west or you know when we get to say uh atlantis or when we get to south america and you really like this faction or that faction we get to europe right or if you want to go there now we have a lot of triax equipment and stuff uh, and it could be you could very easily uh expand that list if you needed to so one of the things i'd say is take get go get the old world book if you don't have it read through it right or world books and then you could do a campaign as part of the new german republic you're you're, you're now playing a, a mech a mech jock mech pilot you know a power armor pilot and robot power, robot uh vehicle pilot uh campaign or you could be doing something where you're lizard men mages in south america or or out some allied group doing i mean just there are so many possibilities that you could do and you could reframe it doesn't always have to be from the traditional north american or or even tomorrow legion or mercenaries or coalition or whatever type of framework you could do a military styled northern uh new german republic campaign you could do you know a freewheeling uh campaign in south america and the land of a thousand isles and then the last thing I'll say is in Rifts for Savage Worlds for the revised edition of the Game Master's Handbook, we actually, add, or I added, um, after discussing this with the fans, I added an entire campaign power level table. So if you can, you because one of the things that we did with the, the, the revised edition is I dialed back the power level a little bit for the starting characters because I think they were a little more powerful than what you would get coming out of um, well, if you created a Palladium Techno Wizard or a Palladium Juicer, uh, I think that the, the ones in Rifts for Savage Worlds were a little more powerful. And that's okay, but when we did the revised edition, we dialed it back a little bit because we wanted to emphasize some of the horror elements. And if everybody's a superhero right out the gate, it's hard to do horror effectively. So um, we dialed that back a little bit, but by popular demand, I added campaign power levels. It's really easy to dial it up a notch to where it was in the first edition. Or all the way up to cosmic heroes flying around, you know, phase world and the dealing with the cosmic forge and cosmo knights. Or the other option is you can dial it back. We actually have a way that you can just build basic savage worlds heroes without iconic frames works, without a Mars package. You don't you're not the glitter boy pilot, right, out the bat. You're not a cyber doc. When you start out, you're you're a, a, a you know a rough and tumble hero just trying to survive in that setting, and that's going to give you more of a Cthulhu esque feel, like when you talked about at the mount uh, the mouth uh, was it Mountains of Madness or um, yeah, and so when if you want to do explore different types of genres, different parts of the world, different power levels and types of stories um, in there that you can, you know, there's certain types of stories you can only tell if you're doing that cosmic level of power. That's that's going to be like the Avengers on steroids, right? But if you, or you could dial it back to these gritty survivors um, trying to survive in a world gone mad and you're going to get something very, very, very different. So I would say those are other ways to change up the formula I am really glad you you brought that up because th that applies to um, rifts and and any game system, right? Um, and, and I see people moving away from that with analogs because of card games and board games and video games where everything is so entrenched. But the beauty of role playing games is that. You are totally in control. You you are the master of that universe. You can tweak it, change it any way that best suits you and your players. So even within rifts, if you know you think a glitter boy is too powerful, you know cut its cut its S, uh, MDC in half or the damage or adjust the characters any way that you think is appropriate. Um, the same thing if you want to do it, you know, big power game and, and you want to boost them up and you want to have players all start at 10th level or something, that's fine too. If it works for you, you know, it's your game. If right. it works for you, then do it. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so another question that we had, and this is again, another similar kind of a game mastering, uh, type of question we got was what about allowing player character how what what are your suggestions for allowing player characters um or players to feel they've had a positive impact on the campaign world do you what what kind of suggestions do you have 
in that light? Well, in some ways, it's almost the same information. Uh, you know, listen to your players. Give everyone uh, – uh, when I'm running a game, and, and remember, I used to run 26 guys, um, so so I got really good at this, which is finding a moment and giving each individual player uh, their opportunity to shine, to, to 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 step up or make a discovery, or or, or kick ass, or or whatever it is. Um, give them that moment to shine. And then something I, I, I used to do, and in part because when I was running 26 people, uh, you know, FYI, by the way, it, it, I, I typically run 6 to 12 these days. Um, but when, when you're running any size group, but, but especially running a big group, what I like to do at the end of the game I mean, and I mean, the game is totally, it's over. People are packing up their stuff and just chit-chatting. Is I like to, to do a summary, sort of go over it and say, wow, Sean, when you, when your character cast that spell, that was genius. And I don't know if you realize it, but if you hadn't done that, this, this, and this might have happened. Or oh, these minions okay. were coming. Uh, and, and, oh, hey, Alex, when you did... Did, did this or when you realize that this guy was the weak, weak link and, and you captured him, that was just, you know, brilliant gaming or Julius, you know, this, wow. When you gave that, when your character gave that speech and it kind of recaps stuff and puts things in a little bit of a perspective, I uh, almost like a, like a director's cut uh, of, of the game where you kind of point out certain things and, and highlight like alternate scenes action. that could have happened almost, or yeah, focus in and, and replay some of the really in, uh, important scenes. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Um, I, you know, this is one of those things that I've been, I've always tried to work on and it was, it's funny because I've never, when I played, Riffs, I think this is part of it's very formative because I would play these hook, line, and sinker type adventure prompts. Well, it doesn't have a railroaded ending, right? Um, and so I, I, I think the I got used to, and the players really enjoyed having kind of that open world feel. And that was my job was to generate that open world on the fly as we played. Um, but you know, you can't always do that. But I, I still think that's the better way to do it. You know, let them even if the adventure module or path or plot point campaign or whatever you're doing says this XYZ has to happen. Well, that's, that's a guideline and use that um, and maybe bring things back I, in uh, if you need to, but, but use that as, as advice, not like, a, 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 you know, some strict thing that has to happen. And uh, one of the things that I have noticed, and maybe this is more common, I don't know if it's more common maybe with Savage Worlds players, because I'm still getting into um, the getting to know how the Savage Worlds fan base plays. And one thing that I noticed is it was a lot of going from, you know, an epic chase to defusing a bomb with an epic dramatic task to an epic social encounter to some combat and then a mass combat of these massive battles. But one of the things that I've seen with, with um, some of the Savage Worlds players is I'd say, hey, these are all really cool things and it's really fun, but it's kind of like when you go see an action movie, a Michael Bay movie or something, and some of his movies are great and some of them are just kind of like, yeah, we'll eat some popcorn and watch it because stuff just starts blowing up and there's so many chase scenes that it all just starts to, to meld together. And sometimes you need to slow it down. You need to slow down the pacing like in Star Wars. The reason that the original trilogy, the lightsaber battles, they weren't doing, you know, all these kung fu moves and all this stuff, but the, the lightsaber battles felt more epic because of all the way to the story that had built up to that conflict. So um, make sure that the conflict that you're including, the chase scenes you're including, the, the combats, the mass battles, that the more meaning and, and that you can build up to them, the more teasing of little things, planting little ideas, and then two sessions later, a session later, a couple of adventures later, they see that coming back or maybe someone that they'd already talked to coming back, bring some of this stuff back into the plot. That's going to make these, 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 these combats and these adventure segments that much more meaningful. And, you know, don't be afraid to slow down and have a discussion. Um, there was, uh, we were, we were actually, I was um, gaming with some of my friends and we're going through actually the in, in parts of humanity, the book I worked on, uh, the book I wrote, uh, 
it um, the plot point campaign that I wrote, we're actually playing through that. So that's been fun. And we're playing through a plot point campaign that I wrote. But we used the journey rules as the players were traveling north out of Chai Town and towards Northern Gun. So they were going through uh, the wilderness, the Wisconsin wilderness. And so we used the, the some journey and, and, and encounter rules. Well, they came across some vampires uh, and then... There was another encounter that was random, and I said, well, you know what, maybe this is the family that the vampires have killed recently. And then they, they, some of the players went through and were going through and saying, okay, is this, is this the whole family? Did anyone, try to, did anyone else escape? Do we need to go try and save them in the middle of this wilderness? And they found out that one of the, the they were t- refugees fleeing from Tolkien, and one of them had before that moved to, um, to Ishpeming to work. And so they ended up going to Ishpeming, finding this this character, and telling him his family was dead. There was no big reward, right? But it but the players were very invested because it was things that they had focused on, right. people that they had cared about, and then they uh, they role played. We role played them breaking it to this kid. Uh, and, it, and it was it was stellar, and we really enjoyed it. And 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 so not everything has to be big action. Sometimes you need to bring that back down to to the kind of personal stories of the characters or the people they meet. So um, that's kind of my advice is, along with yours. Um, I think that these are ways that you can make it all feel uh, like a, 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 the characters are part of, of that world. So. I, I agree completely, and I often say that, and this is about writing in general, but but certainly about role-playing, which is it's all about the characters and the story. And, and so think about any movie, any book, any comic book, any uh, TV series that you love, it's probably because you love the characters. You right. care about the characters. And so when you're role-playing, when, you, when you're running a, a, a game as the game master, and, and that get back to giving the characters their moment to shine, it doesn't have to be, you know, oh, when you plunge that final death blow into the big bad villain, it can be something small or touching or humorous. Right. Uh, I have a lot of humor in, in, in my games, actually. And... Uh, and those little details make a difference too. Uh, and you kind of, your whole example was a beautiful one because it really emphasized character. And, and when I talk about asking questions, you took that story element and said, what if it was related to this and that and tied them together? I love improv. That's my whole style of, of gaming is improvisation and open endedness. Right. Um, which I, I, I think are reflected in, in, in my books. Cause I, again, to me, that's the freedom and, and beauty of, of role playing. Um, but I had a, a, a similar experience with, with a couple of NPCs and one was, and this is my old fantasy game. Whenever the defilers, the, the main group, the 26 guys came back into town, there was this little girl who would always offer them a flower. And, and of course, she, she worked for her dad, and they, they would like you to buy more flowers. But And, and she just, you know, and there she was just this cute little, totally non-essential character that, but she was just sort of always there. Mm-hmm. And one day they come back, and she's not there. And the everyone in the group, noticed it and they're like is she okay is she sick did something happen and and, and to be honest i had just forgot to mention she was there (laughs) but now you've got fuel right exactly i listened to my players and i'm like yeah you you don't know you you need to investigate if, if you're if you're concerned and that spun into a whole adventure that I just spun off at the top of my head, and it was it was great. I had another interesting, similar thing as a game master with. I had this character, this NPC, who I just kind of, to be honest, I just kind of got tired of him. He was kind of a, I thought, kind of a two-dimensional character. Um, 
he, he, he was sort of this uh, stoner who had the heart of a hero and wanted to be a hero. Right. And he would always proudly announce that he was a paladin and he could prove it because he had paid 500 golds for this certificate <laughs> that told him he was a paladin. And nothing anyone could say could dissuade him from the fact that he was a paladin. And, and, and his name was Fearless, or, or that's what he was called. And, and he was <laughs> but by no means a paladin. He, he no got his ass fearless, kicked right. on a regular basis. But because he had the heart of a paladin, there were many a time where he would jump in front of a villain's blade to save one of the player characters, you know, that kind of a thing. You know, when, when I also like to use NPCs sometimes to help nudge my, my players. So there'd be times where something's going on in, in the group. And it'd be funny because, you know, the Defilers are these 26 badasses. You know, they're, they're all pretty, they had they'd gotten pretty high level. But, but they were always trying to avoid trouble, which was kind of cool. <laughs> But, you know, sometimes I would use fearless to, what, unhand that fair maiden, you lout? And the group would be like, oh, no. So, he, he, you know, he was kind of this, he wasn't an idiot, but he was this good-hearted stoner. Sure. sure. So, anyways, after a while, I, I got kind of tired of things. And um, one of the other players who had turned evil had said, you know, I, I, I want to kill fearless. Do, do you mind? And he had sort of set up this plan, and I'm like, no, go for it. That That's fine. And so he goes through his plan, which is really clever and smart, and he kills Fearless. And I swear to God, everyone at the table, and again, we're talking 20-plus guys, all stood up and went, what? <laughs> which is great when you have that emotion, you know, in, in your players. And the one guy who the bad guy, the bad player character was trying to make this, this deal that would make him and this other guy filthy rich and put him in this position of power. That player also loved fearless. And so he's like, I teleport behind him and cut off his head because he had a vorpal blade, right? Oh, okay. We're still part D and D part. And, and, and other players like, no, 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 wait, 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 we can talk about this. He's like, I teleport behind him and cut off his head. No, wait, wait. And the guy turns to me in like super serious and says, Kevin, I don't care what this guy has to say. I teleport behind him and I cut off his head and he rolls. <laughs> and I'm like, your head goes rolling on the ground. And, and again, it was just those kind of, New, and he couldn't resurrect Fearless the way his, his death happened. Um, so he's gone. So that, that sense of the fact that, yes, you are mortal, and maybe you can't survive everything is important, I think, too. There has to be that sense of, of life and death in, in the games to have that more dramatic effect. And you had this just wonderful... Fearless was just sort of this dopey character, and yet the players loved him. They felt that loss. It motivated the whole group to go on and, and destroy the bad guys. It, 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 was, it turned into epic, something epic. And, and I was just like, yeah, I'm tired of the character. You want to kill him, go ahead. And it was this magnificent thing that those players talk about that moment to, to this freaking day, like like 40 years later. Right. So, right. And, and again, the beauty of role-playing. So, yes, getting your, your, your players invested and um, feeling like they are part of a whole, uh, they are part of a team, that they're all important in their own way, that's really necessary. And, uh, and don't be afraid to improvise and, and go with it. Uh, to me, as a game master, those are the most exciting parts when my players surprise me. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Same. Yeah, well, because, I mean, what other better compliment can you get when a player takes something from the game world and wants to integrate it into their character? And some people might say, well, well, this guy is trying to pick up the Shimmerian Railgun and use it, but, hey, you know what? Work on it. There's some way you can make that happen because now that player is invested in this event that happened. They're never going to forget it. This is now something special to them, and you can build that into your story, right? Um, one of the, I, I do have a bit of, of advice that I was going to say that occurred to me while you were talking about use the tools that you have, but but 
I, I, I have to ask before I forget, you're talking about the defilers, and I have a big question about the defilers because they're mentioned here and there, sprinkled all over the place. Uh, Lord Coke of the Cyber Knights, Robert Grizzly Carter, the Palladium World uh rain you know elven ranger that's in 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 reed's rangers i mean are these are these all are we seeing kind of diaspora characters from from the defilers uh in in riffs um you, you don't have well, to answer if you don't want to i don't want to spoil anything but you know i've always been curious about some of those characters we read about so 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 yeah i, I that that playing group it was it was my really my my, my first the first big group that I ran and, and I had just some marvelous players. And I think part of it too, was that um, we were all new to role playing, which I didn't realize. I thought I was actually a new guy. And I, I would find out like 10 years later that all of them had just started playing like, you know, two months before I did. Gotcha. Uh, it was all pretty new back then though. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and, and um, they were just so good. Uh, and he created such memorable characters that, yeah, a lot of times I like to seed them in here and there. And, and I, I've thought about writing um, adventure books or novels based on the Defilers. Uh, again, it's a matter of time. Sure. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I like to drop them in from time to time because they just hold a really special place in my heart. Cool. I've noticed. I've yeah. I've noticed some. What I'm like. I'm like. Is that is that a defiler? Um, but uh, that's really cool. And one of the things I was gonna say um, was that you know about using the, the the tools you have. I mean, Palladium books have massive charts and tables for. There's a, a a ley line storm at sea, or a ley line storm over land, or you know a rift opens, or just these th things like that that I've always enjoyed. And 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 when um, the the team was doing rifts for Savage Worlds, the Game Master's Handbook has a lot of those. I added one about uh, about um, generating settlements, so you can procedurally generate settlements as you're going around to help kind of give you that right rifts flavor and feel and something new. Um, uh, to spark the game master's imagination so, instead of drain them, um, and that's how I kind of look at those tools. Maybe maybe you don't need to roll more than once, right? Maybe you don't like a result, but that's okay. But use those tools. Um, I know Sean Bertrand did a really great uh, table for uh, fade towns uh, that you might encounter in the Federation of Magic territory, where they're fading in and out of existence, and all the different types of things. And there's also a really great uh, adventure in Arcana and Mysticism uh, that he put together about a fate town. But um, the the other thing is, is I'll, I'll give a kind of a personal example of my players were going and they're traveling to, I mean, I already had the adventure prepared, right? A series of adventures that I'd written up and um, I was uh, actually, run, I'd run it at some conventions by running for them. And uh, they're on their way there and someone rolled a critical failure on their navigation role, the leader of the party, right? So uh, I was like, oh man. And I was like, wait, no, we've got a table for this. There's a table for what happens if you, you know, botch a, a navigation role. So I check it and it's, it's you know, uh, I, I, said, I said, well, let's let's do a ley line storm. So I throw and I, I, I randomly determine what kind of ley line storm it is well. It's a ley line storm that generates rifts. So then I roll, I, I I roll or pull cards or whatever, and on the table in the game master's handbook for what kind of rift it is, and it's an explosive one. And so they're trying to get away, they're rushing away in the middle of this crazy storm, and one of the guys who wasn't in the main vehicle, their mountaineer or whatever, gets sucked into the explosive rift, and the whole team is like, oh no, this is. This phenomenon isn't going to last long. They turn around and the whole team drives into it. And I'm like, okay, let's take a break. You guys go take a <laughs> drink and get some snacks and bring me bring me a drink and maybe put some, you know, put some scotch in it or something. But or you know, not scotch, but you know what I mean. Uh, you know, but, but I was like, hey, give me give me something uh, and and give me ten minutes. And so I went and I we have some tables for you know what kind of rift is it? Where does it go? Uh, what's the different details of the dimension? How far away it is? Is there a time dilation? So they ended up in um, the 1800s in an alternate version of Earth in Louisiana. And I'm like, 1800s, Louisiana? 
and there's magic and the dimensions being invaded by Cthulhu type monsters so I picked the Mego in my mind if anyone's familiar with some of the Cthulhu lore and um, I said you know what what's interesting I'll, I'll go big or go home right with this because this is totally random I'm gonna go big or go home I said you know what how about in this alternate timeline Napoleon never sold the the Louisiana Purchase so they end up fighting Cthulhu monsters uh, that are fight that uh, that are in battle with French French uh, musketeers and uh, their Native American allies they save nice. one of the musketeers and a Native American ally. They head to New Orleans. Uh, they realize that some big event is coming uh, where the uh, the bad guys are, you know, the Migo, the, these Chthonic enemies, are trying to take this one hill where there's a nexus point so that they can draw in more demons and monsters to come and attack them. And Napoleon's court mage uh, happened to be there, and he says... We've been we've been building up our army. We knew this was coming because of this this stellar alignment that's going to happen. Uh, if you can get us help our army get to the top of that hill, we can send you home with that power instead. And then, of course, the next day Napoleon shows up with reinforcements, and so we use the mass battle rules for rifts. And they had Napoleon's rolling the battle rolls as the commander of the good guys. The players are each making checks to, you know, I charged the enemy line, or um, the techno wizard was helping to boost the power of the cannons that the that the French had, and uh, another guy was was healing uh, people with his psychic abilities to reduce casualties. It was epic, and at the end. They are going to leave, and Napoleon's like, uh, "Best of luck, good good luck." But hey, you have these miraculous weapons and armor. I want I want one of each of your weapons. I want one of each of your pieces of armor so that our, our, we can study it. And they're like, "Oh no, we're going to mess up this timeline and give Napoleon weapons and armor he shouldn't have." <laughs> and it was true conflict, but it was it was a lot of fun. And my buddy said. That was one of the craziest, coolest sessions that we had, and it was completely unplanned. And I wouldn't have been able to just come up with that on my own, but by using these procedurally generated tables, uh, you know, allies and enemies, different possible rewards, and all that kind of stuff, just using those tools um, that are available in, in, in your books and our books, you, you can get a lot of mileage out of it, and it can really spark your imagination. So that's the last suggestion I have on that topic. Um, but do you have anything else you wanted to follow up with that? Yeah, I just want to say too is is and this kind of goes in with with humor is and, and characters is d don't be afraid to let the characters have a moment of silliness, right? Because again, sometimes that can lead to something very memorable, very fun. Uh, plus, it's good to laugh, so let them be silly. We're all silly in real life. Yeah. Um, that could, cool. A, a great example of that it, again. This happens to go back to my Defiler game. Is um, I had this uh, because I, I would let, let players bring in their D and D characters of, of any level, any power. When I was running this stuff, so I had this this dwarf who's just laden in magic, and he's tough as can be, and he's arrogant as hell, and he goes kind of wandering off the path to to take a pee, right? Got to go bathroom. And I'm like, okay. And, you know, he whips out his thing. He's about to pee. And I say, oh, you noticed there's a fairy there. Uh-oh. And, and it's like smiling and waving. I pee on its head. This turned into this totally silly, whacked out thing where he gets stripped naked. They take half of his, his magic items and stuff. Um, they make him dance until he collapses. Anyone who tried to go in and, and stop them also falls. Because it's a whole, it turns out it wasn't just one fairy, it, it was a whole bunch. You know, they of were, course. and I had given them hints, you know, that there's a fairy mound and a circle of flowers. Well, they all ignored it. <laughs> it was great. And it, it totally changed his character. First of all, he was terrified of fairies. <laughs> the whole group had this tremendous respect for fairies and be like, yeah, you see a fairy or a brownie, they'd be like, oh no. Well, we're totally respectful. And you know, and it was it was epic. And, and again, it was just a silly moment that I ran with. I didn't expect him to have his character pee on a fairy's head. You know, it was as you might imagine, quite a surprise to the fairy and, and an insult. So 
you know, it, it, it was just it was just great, and it set up ferries for the next forever. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I can see how that's uh, has influenced even riffs and the lore and what will happen oh, yeah. if you mess with the fairies, right? So that's oh, it has. I mean, it totally it, it really helped develop for me my idea on how fairies worked and how everything went because I had never really done anything with with fairies up to that point, and I had never really figured out, you know, how how they would address a situation like that yeah it was fantastic that's, <laughs> and that's long lasting ramifications yeah that's really fun yeah no i and you know and it's funny um you know different game systems have different ways they approach things right but in savage worlds um one of the things that you do is as you instead of leveling up you rank up and you um you uh, you know in palladium the palladium role-playing game and a lot of i guess traditional RPGs, you go up a level, everything improves, right? Your skills improve, your saves improve a little bit. Savage Worlds is a little bit different because you choose how the character improves. Um, you choose whether to raise a skill or an attribute or to get a new edge or feat, as most uh, Dungeons & Dragons players would call it. Um, and one of the things we did that was really fun, and I just kind of decided, I've got a couple of buddies that are just wacky guys, and uh, we've been playing Rifts for decades. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and one of them is from my original group, right? And, uh, we, uh, they were, they're, they're ranking up and when you get enough ranks, you get up to seasoned. So you're a seasoned adventurer before you move on towards like veteran and then a full hero and a legendary figure. Um, and I said, you know what, let's, I, again, this is the whole thing. I said, like, let's slow it down a little bit. Let's see what happens. What, what, because all these characters were changing a little bit as they ranked up, right? And so the, the, in, in uh, Rifts for Savage Worlds, one of the ways we've dealt with, with um, juicers is we have the juicer upgrade treatments. Where if you're a traditional juicer, you can go get the upgrade treatment to become a Titan juicer or whatever, right? And so... Um, and then one of the guys, he had gotten a lot of loot, the Glitter Boy pilot, and he's, he wants to deck himself out with cyberware, right? Um, and so what we did is, is um, we role-played that. Instead of just taking the advances that the characters would get and getting his, his cybernetics and just being like, okay, let's move on, um, they went to the, the Kingsdale Enhancement Clinic, the Keck in Kingsdale. And if you go pick up the world books, you know... Uh, I think that one's in Juicer Uprising, but you can actually read through and see who's the, the guy that owns it. His wife is an elf, you know, all this detail, right? So we did that, and then I they have money, and the, the, the there's two of the characters. One's a, a juicer, and the other's a crazy, and they're the Red Star brothers, and they're nuts. And they're the, my two players that know Rifts the best, right? They've been playing it. We've been playing it forever. And so... Uh, the juicer's getting the upgrade treatment. The the glitter boy pilot decides to 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 go in at the same time and go through his cyber surgery at the same time. And the brother, the crazy, he's like, "All right, I want to I want to take care of my brother." And he goes hog wild, and he basically gets them to rent him a room that he turns into a karaoke room with like spinning light ball and colored flashy lights and. They're hiring people to come in and bring them catered meals and they're partying and, and, and karaoke and watching old pre-riffs movies. And it was so silly, but it was so much fun that I just let them kind of have this zany chance. But guess what? Now they're, they, they know, they've been to the King, Kingsdale Enhancement Clinic. They know what it's like there. They've partied with some of the staff, you know, and that brings that world to life. And I just, you know... They had some crazy ideas. I kind of, you know, I, I, I helped them kind of hype a little bit of it up. Um, and we had a lot of fun. And some of the other ones went to, uh, I forget the, the name of the, the gun emporium that's there where Northern Gun has a major um, major release hub. And they bought a, a, a big Mountaineer ATV and painted it like the A-Team the van from the old A-Team TV show. And I mean, it just, they went nuts and they had fun, but, but they all know exactly what's going on and it's much more realistic to them because i let them have some fun it always doesn't always have to be shooting bad guys right it could be something that that is sparked out of a random fun thing that that, that happens um so yeah that's that's just my kind of similar kind of story there uh that i think that people could hopefully uh take a little cue from um well i mean i'm through our list of questions 
Um, and I know you're a busy man, Kevin. You've, you've already gone through all this interview with me, um, and I've really enjoyed it. Is there anything else that you wanted to chat about? Um, or anything else you wanted to ask or say to the fans, you know, of, of both riffs, Palladium's published materials, Savage, Riffs for Savage Worlds? I mean, again, I kind of see it all as riffs, you know, like we've discussed. Um, sure. But is there anything else you wanted to share with the fans? Uh, I just want to say it's been a pleasure doing this interview with you, Sean. Um, and, uh, you know, as, as for the fans, you know, especially during these kind of scary times with the coronavirus and everything else, just, you know, stay frosty. Uh, you know, be true to yourself, be true to your friends. Um, you know, use gaming as a refuge and, uh, you know, keep those imaginations burning bright. I love you guys. Yeah, uh, I, 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 that's one thing I'll say is I, uh, I, I know that you love the fans. I know you, you love the material in the worlds, and, and I feel the same way. I mean, uh, they asked me to do an interview for Gen Con Online, and I was like, yeah, man, whatever the fans need, you know. So um, anybody who watches this, if you've got uh, your own fan channel or YouTube or whatever and uh, you want to chat, I'm always available. Um, but we really love you. We care about you. And uh we hope that everybody's safe and happy, and we're doing our best to provide you everything we can uh, to uh, help you be able to game and, 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 and stuff with your friends during these tough times, and also to support you with the products that, uh, that we can. So uh, it's a, a lot of times it's not about do we want to do it, it's just like what can we do, what do we have the budget to do. You know, uh, people like you, and especially you and Shane Hensley, you only have so much time in the day, right? So we're all trying to see every see what we can do to, to bring more stuff to y'all. And we appreciate everyone being patient and their support uh, because when you share our products with your friends, when you, when you purchase our products or take a look at our products even, it's supporting us and it's helping us uh, to be able to continue to, to uh, have, have the privilege to, to work on them. So again, thanks to the fans. And again, Kevin, thanks again. Um, I know we've kind of become friends, and I, I, uh, I, 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 that really tickles me. But it's as a you, you know, people sometimes ask me what some of my influences are, and and you're 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 one of the big greats. So uh, when it comes to gaming and storytelling, and so it's been really great to interview. It's been really great working with you. I look forward to doing it for a long time to come. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll end the episode there. Um, but again, everybody. Uh, if you'd like to support the channel here, uh, hit the like button, share this video with your friends, uh, especially any, any Riffs fans. I think they'll, 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 they'll get a kick out of it. It's a bit long form, obviously. This is why we couldn't uh, do it for like Gen Con Online because it's just too much. But um, I think we'll be having uh, bits and pieces of this probably also posted uh, to Palladium TV if you follow their channel. Um, and please uh, subscribe to my channel. Most of the time I do live live. Uh, segments so uh, timing seems to be really hard sometimes so if you just hit that uh, the notification icon so you can know when I'm gonna go live a lot of my friends have done that and they t and suddenly they're able to chat with me live and, and ask questions and stuff so um, again I uh, hope everybody's doing well and safe and sound and uh, healthy and we'll talk to you all again soon we'll have to do this again soon Kevin take care <laughs>